How much am I being paid for this again? Uh, one million dollars. Hello, I'm R.R. Stein. I write the Goosebumps books. As you may recall from your last two Goosebumps vlogs, my 16th favourite booktuber, How to Train Your Gavin, has been covering the main Goosebumps series that I have been writing. I don't know about you, but I'm patiently waiting for Gavin's series to end. Sit back and relax for the next two hours as Gavin goes through the Goosebumps Horrorland and Hall of Horror series that I wrote. And if you were me, you would be terrified of that. Why? You're about to find out. Viewer beware, you're in for a scare. Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. Today is a very special day because it's September 1st, which marks the one year anniversary since I first began my first ever Goosebumps challenge. Yes, this time last year I started my 62 book original Goosebumps vlog project. And that vlog kind of changed my life and it changed the trajectory of my channel. So I owe that vlog so much. And there were times, there were times when I wanted to give up on that Goosebumps project. And I'm so glad I didn't because that video has ended up becoming one of my most viewed videos ever. It is currently my second longest video on my channel at three and a half hours. Number one is the Animos vlog at four and a half hours. So I'm anticipating this vlog to be another big one. So yes, this will be the third and fourth Goosebumps series I'll be tackling in a vlog. So I have already tackled the 62 book original series as well as the 25 book series 2000 series and I have been reading every single book I've read out of 10 and this is what the current main series averages look like so so far we have Goosebumps with a 5.33 out of 10 average out of 62 books and series 2000 has 5.95 out of 10 out of 25 books so I'm really interested to see how the 19 Horrorland books and the 6 Hall of Horror books will compare so yeah that is exactly why I'm doing this vlog I am reading the 19 Horrorland books that have been published as well as the 6 Hall of Horrors books as well. So I've decided to put them in the one vlog because these were originally supposed to be Goosebumps Horrorland Hall of Horrors but then I think the title was too long so they cut it out but it's still according to the Goosebumps Wikia page part of the main Goosebumps series which is why I'm reading it in this vlog series. So the Goosebumps Horrorland series was originally published between 2008 and 2011. Apparently there are two arcs. The first 12 books are one arc and then the final seven books are a second arc and I'm really intrigued to find out what that means because the original Goosebumps series and the series 2000 books have mainly been standalone books. Sometimes the book would have a sequel, but in the Horrorland series, there is a running storyline, there is an overarching plot, there are characters, I believe, that kind of meet up in Horrorland, and strange and spooky adventures happen. Genuinely cannot tell you anything about these books until I've read them because unlike the original series and the series 2000 books, I've never read the Horrorland books before in my life. Never even touched them, never even sniffed them. I have no clue what I'm getting myself in for. So there will be no nostalgia whatsoever with this series. Not that that's ever helped because I have always been honest, maybe a little bit too honest sometimes, about my feelings with Goosebumps. And then the six Hall of Horrors books were published between 2000 2011 and 2012. And in this series, each book tells the story about a child visiting the titular Hall of Horrors in Horrorland, which again is why it's part of the Horrorland series. And each of these books are standalone stories. We've got a bit of a mix here. We have an overarching plot in the Horrorland series, apparently, and then we have standalones in the Hall of Horror series. It's gonna be a really random mix, and I'm very excited to see how this one turns out. So a little rundown of all the books, list of the books that I'm reading in this vlog. In the Horrorland series, we have Revenge of the Living Dummy, Creep from the Deep, Monster Blood for Breakfast, The Scream of the Haunted Mask, Dr. Maniac versus Robbie Schwartz, Who's Your Mummy? Who's Your Mommy? My Friends Call Me Monster, Say Cheese and Die Screaming, Welcome to Camp Slither, Help We Have Strange Powers, Escape from Horrorland, The Streets of Panic Park, When the Ghost Dog Howls, Little Shop of Hamsters, Heads You Lose, We Adore Halloween, The Wizard of Ooze, Slappy New Year, and The Horror at Chilla House. So that is all of the Horrorland books. Of the Hall of Horrors books we have Claws, Night of the Giant Everything, The Five Masks of Doctor Scream, Why I Quit Zombie School, Don't Scream, I know what you're thinking. And The Birthday Party of No Return. So that's all of the books. And honestly, a lot of them sound fantastic by the title alone. It sounds like a lot of them are kind of spiritual successors to some of the original stories in Goosebumps and Series 2000, like The Haunted Mask, my favorite Goosebumps book of all time so far. And we also had Say Cheese and Die, Monster Blood. So it sounds like we have 
maybe possibly some sequels to those stories. And honestly, Mr. Stein has milked a lot of his original ideas dry. So I'm praying, praying to the Goosebumps gods that these kind of sequels will be somewhat good. So what are you gonna expect in this video? Well, I'm gonna try my best <laughs> to read all of these in five days. I'm gonna give myself a 25 books in five days challenge. Five books a day, I think, would be very doable. The most Goosebumps books I've read in one day is five, potentially six, when I did my original Goosebumps vlog. So I think I can do that again with the Horrorland and Hall of Horror series. Yeah, I, I think it's doable. I will be going in depth on every single book, so I will tell you exactly what the book is about, the plot twists, what I thought of the book, what I liked about the book, what I hated about the book, and absolutely everything that I possibly can. So this will probably be a lengthy video, but there will be spoilers around every single corner. So bear that in mind going forward. And then and at the end of this video, I will be ranking all of the books from worst to best. I did that with my Series 2000 vlog. I didn't with my original Goosebumps series. I did a separate ranking video for that because the original vlog just went on far too long and it would have just been too long to include that ranking as well. So I will have the end of this video ranking all of the books from worst to best. So I guess if you want to skip to that part, then feel free. I do have timestamps in the description box for every single book so you can skip to any section you want, including book section segments and the ranking at the end and anything else that might happen during this vlog. I think that's everything I needed to tell you. So without further ado, I'm going to get straight into my first five Goosebumps Horrorland books and hopefully you will join me for this ride. Now Mr. Stein, show me what you got. I'm about to start the first Horrorland book. I have my pumpkin spice frappuccino ready to start this new adventure. So excited. I won't have to put you down for this, but I noticed something. On the first page, it has like three, I guess, different stories, almost like short stories. It says three rides in one. Although they might all be connecting. It might just be chapters, maybe. But then in each section, they have chapters. So... I will have to read this and let you know exactly what this is about, but this is already so different to the original series and the series 2000. And if you're wondering why there's so much noise, it's because Ash is playing with a Starbucks straw that I don't use. <laughs> so already I'm so intrigued, but there are fear files at the end with sort of different things in it, including a map. I love the fact that there's a map, although it's not like an amazing map. And then at the start, it has a sort of like stay at Horrorland kind of advertisement. Your stay includes comfortable beds of nails, sliming pool, daily house creeping. Call ahead, people are dying to get in. Check in, 4 p.m. Check out, no one has yet. <laughs> Don't forget to stop by our gift shop. <laughs> so I kind of love the fact that this is a little bit more interactive than the previous books. I also forgot to mention as well that R.L. Stein had fallen out with Scholastic in 2000, which is why the series 2000 series stopped completely. And between 2000 and 2008, there weren't any Goosebumps stories at all. So Goosebumps Horrorland, Revenge of the Living Dummy was the first Goosebumps book in eight years. So there was a huge gap between sort of like the original run of the original series and series 2000 to this one. So it'll be really interesting to see if that eight year gap did anything because one of my main criticisms of the original series was that R.L. Stein was writing them far too quickly so that the books were too repetitive, nothing was original anymore and they felt rushed and weren't that good by the end of it. So hopefully the break reinvigorated R.L. Stein and this series will blow the other two series out of the water because he had the time to write them and produce them and Scholastic weren't breathing down his neck essentially. I'm also going to time how long I take to read the first book to see if reading five books in one day is actually doable because I do have two cats to look after. Honestly, I think they've got the zoomies right now, so they're going to want to play. But I do want to say like in the ballpark of like how long it takes me to read one of these books. So let's get started. 56 minutes. That's how long it took to read that with this cute baba. Hey baby, keep me company while reading all that book. Okay, Mr. Stein, I see what you did, I see what you did. So I have managed to finish the first five books in the first day of this challenge. So it is doable, it is doable. I could have finished these so much earlier as well. But every single time I finished one, I would take about an hour break. <laughs> I would take about an hour break, I would procrastinate for a bit, and then go back to it. So I was in no rush to... <laughs> oh, oh god, oh. <laughs> I don't know if you could say that, but literally, literally, 
we've got WWE wrestling up in here. So I can read five in a day. It is doable. But the question is, do I want to do that? I mean, short answer, no, not really. But you know, I've never been one to back down from a challenge. So I'm gonna persevere. Not that these were terrible. There's probably two in here that are absolutely terrible. But overall, we're off to a good start. And I can see the kind of creativity Mr. Stein is imbuing in the Horrorland series, especially since the series 2000 series, was getting a little bit stale. Like you could kind of see through the formula, all of the books were pretty formulaic and predictable. And while there are some trappings in these books, I can see the kind of angle that it's kind of gone for. And I'm digging that. So before I talk about the first book, Revenge of the Living Dummy, and talk about each book after that too, I do wanna say if you don't know, because I didn't until reading these books, but when I mentioned before that it looked like there was like three kind of short stories in here, that's not right. So in each book we follow a certain character, they're going about their daily life, and then something weird and spooky happens, and then that kind of ends after like 100 pages, and then they get invited to Horrorland randomly, and they don't know why they've been invited, you know, the trip's free, and they can take anybody they want with them. They're kind of like VIPs in Horrorland, and they don't know why. So then the kind of second part of the book, which only lasts around about like nine chapters, has them in Horrorland, and they interact with the other characters from the other books. So in each story we have different characters, and we follow their... Do you mind? So in each book we are following different characters, but then they all kind of come together in the Horrorland sections. Although we are slowly getting to each of the characters, they're slowly coming into Horrorland. So yeah, it's kind of like a slow build, but it is really cool to have that kind of element in this series. Honestly, that door is so squeaky, isn't it? It's so squeaky. Do you want to maybe take that in the living room? Yeah. Oh my god. Anyway, let's talk about the first oh, that's not the first one. Anyway, let's talk about the first book. So Revenge of the Living Dummy, and I noticed that these covers are very shiny and it's gonna be reflecting the fairy lights on my YA and adult bookshelves. I apologize, the setup is kinda of shite right now, but it's quite late now and yeah, I should have done this while there was daylight. Why are you fighting in here? <laughs> Guys, I'm working. So Revenge of the Living Dummy, our main character is Brittany and she has a cousin called Ethan who is coming to stay. And Ethan brings a ventriloquist dummy who he is called Mr. Bad Boy. And it's, oh God, it like, honest, right, okay. One of the things that I don't really like about Goosebumps is the repetitiveness of it. And you can really tell when R.L. Stein is just borrowing his own ideas and kind of repurposing it for a, a new story, which isn't really all that new. So I actually found that this book was very much like Night of the Living Dummy 2. We have Ethan with this ventriloquist dummy, and this ventriloquist dummy is kind of doing things on its own. Brittany also has a best friend called Molly, but her full name is Molly Malloy. <laughs> And I don't know why, but that made me laugh so much. And it's literally the first line as well. You may wonder why my best friend, Molly Malloy, and I were in the graveyard late at night. So it starts off pretty well. We have Molly and Brittany kind of digging in the graveyard. They're trying to bury something and we don't know what it is. And we don't find out what it is until a little bit later on. And what I kind of like about this book is that we have some storylines that kind of tie together quite nicely by the end of it. And something that R.L. Stein did in his original and series 2000 series is that he would just throw curveballs in, which he still does in some of these books. But like we had a, an actual, uh, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like his stories never make a whole lot of sense. And sometimes you do have to suspend your disbelief in order to believe what he's telling you. But there was actually some kind of like poetic, almost a poetic story going on here because we have something that's introduced quite early on that comes back and helps in the end. So usually we have a bit of a, a Deus Ex Machina, I don't know how to say that word, going on in a lot of the Goosebumps stories, something comes out of nowhere and saves the day. But in this one, we kind of have a, a resolution that makes sense. So we do have that ventriloquist dummy main storyline. And a secondary storyline we have is that Molly's dad has brought home this shrunken head thing and it's cursed and if you touch it it will take your mind and that is actually what Molly and Brittany are burying in the very first chapter. We go like back and forth in timeline wise and it, it's quite cool that way I thought it was actually quite a good 
way of telling the story. So R.L. Stein, I'll give you props for that. That whole shrunken head thing is cool because one, it's kind of like a callback to how I got my shrunken head from the original series. And two, the fact that it comes back at the end and kind of like saves the day almost. So we do have the story with the dummy and Ethan is blamed for all of the things the dummy does. Hello, baby. Oh, bye, baby. And that's just like Night Living Dummy 2 and Night Living Dummy 1 and Night Living Dummy 3 and Bride of the Living Dummy. Like it's like every single other Living Dummy book. Every single one. Like it's kind of just a like rinse and repeat storyline. So nothing new out of the gate here. But then we do have Brittany and Molly discovering that Ethan has actually been controlling the dummy with a like a TV remote kind of thing. And Brittany finds out that the dummy is actually called Slappy and she has the words, the words that breathes life into Slappy but also puts him back to sleep. So she thinks she's putting him to sleep but actually she's waking him up because Ethan has been controlling it the entire time even though he's been trying to convince her and even convince me like I did think that Sabi was alive yeah he's convinced us that the dummy Mr. Bad Boy he's called it comes to life on its own but actually no Ethan has been practicing them all along so Brittany accidentally wakes Slappy up so then the shrunken head thing actually zaps Slappy and puts him to sleep or at least we think it does a lot of R.L. Stein endings are cliffhangers this is no exception so I did kind of like like the story but it didn't blow me away what I did really enjoy though was that we got to Horrorland because when that started, I was like, oh, so this is why this is Goosebumps Horrorland. Because we had that whole, you know, singular story was all happening away from Horrorland. I was like, well, why is this called Goosebumps Horrorland? But no, Brittany has been invited as a VIP to Horrorland. And when she's at Horrorland, she goes on like some rides. Her parents come with her, but then her parents, you know, go missing. And there is like this camera that her dad brought and Slappy is on this camera. So it seems like Horrorland has brought Brittany to the theme park and Slappy may also be there. So I found that really, really interesting and actually like it made me give this one a little bit more of a higher rating than what I was going to give it. So just on a base level, I think I would give this like 2.5 stars. But in terms of Copile, which is the rating system that I use, it was created by Jay Book Roast. And that's essentially rating seven different areas of a book out of 10 and then averaging that all out to give you a complete average at the end. So the seven areas are characters, atmosphere, writing, plot, intrigue, logic, and enjoyment. So I rate all of those out of 10 and then it comes out with an average. I'm going to give you my Copile rating of every single Living Dummy book so far so that you can see how this one compares. So out of 10, Night of Living Dummy got 7.71 and then the second Night of Living Dummy got 7.79. The third Night of the Living Dummy got 4.57. So there was quite a decline in that one. I didn't really like that one all that much. And then Bride of the Living Dummy got 6.71. So we kind of brought it back up. And then Savvy's Nightmare got 6.14. So it slipped back down a little bit. So Revenge of the Living Dummy in Core Pile out of 10 gets 5.29. So this is what we're starting off the Goosebumps Horrorland series with. It's definitely the weakest Goosebumps opener. So for the original series, we had Welcome to Dead House and I really enjoyed that book. And then for the series 2000 series, we had Cry of the Cat. And again, I really enjoyed that book. It's probably one of the best books in the series 2000 series. And then in this one, we kind of started off quite low, at least for me anyway. I know a lot of people do eat Slappy up and think he's like the best thing since sliced bread. And honestly, to begin with, he was, he really, really was. He was a great R.L. Stein Goosebumps creation, but every single book he's been in, well, I guess Slappy's Nightmare changed things up a bit, but they mainly followed the same copy and paste storyline. And this one is no different. So 5.29, that's what we're starting out with, with the series. But honestly, this made me so intrigued to read on because of the whole Horrorland aspect of it at the end. <laughs> So moving on from Revenge of the Living Dummy, we have the second book, which is Creep from the Deep. And I started reading this and I had no idea it was part of the Deep Trouble saga. So Deep Trouble, there were two books in the original series and I did not like them. I'm going to give you my ratings for them now. And the first Deep Trouble, I gave 3.86 out of 10. And then Deep Trouble 2, I gave 4.29 out of 10. So it kind of went up a little bit by the second one. So what do you think I gave Creep from the Deep? Well, I actually gave this one 7.36 out of 10. A really solid like four star. It's it's quite high up there actually. This was a really good one. Like my favorite one so far of the five I've read. And I was so scared reading this, right? Because one of the things, one of the main, main things I hate about Goosebumps is when it actually turns out to not be real, right? Or everything turned out to be a prank. And that's what Goosebumps does a little bit too often. But in this one, right, I was reading it and reading it. I was thinking, okay, this storyline is like so good and so scary, but like, it's totally gonna be a joke, right? Somebody's gonna come out and say, gotcha, at any minute, right? Like I was waiting for that to happen and it never Never happened and I was like okay okay right this is actually great because I love it when Goosebumps is actually scary I love it when it's not fake like that's my favorite kind of Goosebumps story and this one actually delivered in the scares in the realness in the enjoyment just it was so good the best deep trouble book 
honestly. I really didn't like the first two, but this one was so good. So yeah, we have Billy and Sheena, and they are, you know, doing more things, more adventures with their uncle. And this time, they go to find this sunken pirate ship. And they're, like, kind of, not exactly finding a treasure, but they kind of want to explain some kind of, like, zombie pirate kind of theory. And honestly, I love that storyline. So we actually had them go into, like, the submarine. They go deep underwater, and that was, like, really terrifying, actually. Like, it was so claustrophobic and atmospheric, and I thought, oh, Arl Stein, you know how to write atmospheric scenes. Why don't you do it more often? So I was really eating it up, and then suddenly Dr. Day disappears. Like, there's this black kind of mist thing that happens, and Dr. Day just disappears. And I'm like, okay, right, he's pulling their leg, isn't he? This is all a prank, right? Because then Billy and Sheena, they go back up to the surface, and then they come across the zombie pirates that were aboard that ship. And the main pirate, Captain Ben, is telling them, give me back what's mine, give me back what's mine. So we think that maybe Billy and Sheena have stolen some treasure or something. But no, it actually turns out that Billy has... Captain Ben's leg, his wooden leg. He's been using it as a sort of like crutch, which honestly kind of took me by surprise and it made a bit sense too. And I really liked that. I thought that was actually a good little kind of turn in the story. Bill and Sheena also come across two men on this like small island and they promise to help them, but then turns out that they are actually part of a, a pirate crew as well that have been alive for like 200 years. And again, I was thinking at any moment someone's gonna come out here and say this is all a joke, but no, it never happened. I was honestly living my best life. I was living my best life. I wanna give this one five stars just for that alone. And then we get to Horrorland. We have the Horrorland section and Billy and Sheena end up coming across Brittany and Molly from the first book. Honestly, there's quite a lot of characters now, especially since they're all kind of coming together at Horrorland. They're trying to keep them all in one place and remember all of their names. It's gonna be a bit hard. But anyway, yes, Billy and Sheena come across Brittany and Molly at Horrorland from the first book. And Brittany and Molly end up going missing. And then Sheena ends up going invisible. And then we meet a guy called Matt as well. Yeah, things are happening in Horrorland. They're realizing that not everything is as it seems. And there is a horror called Oh, what was he called again? Byron, I think his name was Byron. He is a horror, he's trying to help the kids for some reason, we don't know why yet. He gave Matt this kind of key card thing that unlocks places and the horrors are trying to chase them and things like that. So yeah, this ends with like Sheena turning invisible and they don't know how to fix it. So we are introduced to Matt, which is a good thing because in the next story, the next novel that we read, Matt is the main character. So I kind of really do enjoy the fact that Arl Stein kind of introduced the character at the end of this book to bring him to the forefront in the next book. I thought that was like really well done as well. So you see, Mr. Stein has been impressing me so much. It's just a shame that the next book is god awful. <laughs> As I just said, this book is god awful. And again, it's because I really don't like the Monster Blood kind of saga. I think they're some of the worst books in the Goosebumps series. And I know people are gonna be so mad at me for saying that, but honestly, what's scary about green slime that gets bigger? That's always easily defeated. And anyway, it's not even that that gets bigger half the time. It's something else that gets bigger. But like, it's just not scary. It's stupid. And like, half the time you never see the monster blood. You never see it. So anyway, monster blood for breakfast. I love the name of it. The name is good, I'll give it that. But my kind of track record with the Monster Blood series is so bad. So for instance, the Monster Blood saga so far, the first Monster Blood got 4.86 out of 10, Monster Blood 2 got 4.57, Monster Blood 3 got 3.00, and then Monster Blood 4 got 2.14. Honestly, Monster Blood 4 is one of my least favorite Goosebumps books ever. And just the whole series in general, I just don't like it. But we do follow Matt, he's a bit of an athlete, and he has a next door neighbor called Bradley who keeps kind of ruining things for him. Honestly, I was getting so sick of Bradley. He was stealing his ideas, getting Matt into trouble, and again, we have more parents, neglectful parents, who are just so god awful. They were kind of bad in the Revenge of the Living Dummy book, they're bad in this one, and they're bad in the next few as well. But bad parents are a recurring theme in Goosebumps as well. But anyway, I take a rest. Monster Blood for breakfast. So yeah, essentially the story is Bradley ends up ordering Monster Blood online, and Matt ends up getting it. Another reason why Bradley is like so annoying, but Bradley kind of swaps his cereal with Matt, and Matt's sister had put some monster blood in the cereal that was intended to go to Bradley because Matt's sister doesn't like Bradley because Bradley teases her, she teases him, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, Matt ends up getting the monster blood, so he ends up growing a bit bigger and he ends up winning his swim meet, okay, because of it. He gets a little bit bigger, so does his ivy plant. And that's it. That's essentially it. He gets a bit bigger. The monster blood, it's there a little bit, and then it does cause some of the conflict of him getting bigger, which he somehow miraculously just manages to get away with. This is kind of like lazy, lazy writing right here. But like, he's turned into a nine foot person, and he's 
at this swim meet and he is in the water and stuff and he wins it, whatever, right? Then he needs to like get out of the water, which he does. He gets out of the water, he goes to the changing rooms and then he has to get home. So he's at the school and he thinks, maybe I thought if I keep low behind hedges and bushes, maybe I can get home without being seen. Next page. Yes, I made it home. Are we not going to see any of that? Like, how do you get home when you're like a nine foot person? You've just suddenly become a giant in this world and you've just managed to get home without anyone noticing. How? How, Mr. Stein? That's just so lazy. Literally the next line. Yes, I made it home. That infuriated me. One thing I do kind of give this one credit for is, I mean, I hated Bradley. He was so annoying. He was getting back into trouble and you could tell he was. But one thing that I kind of understood with Bradley is that he thought that Munster Blood would make him bigger because he gets teased for being too skinny and he gets called worm a lot, even by the main character, Matt. Like, Matt also bullies him and, and calls him names. So the reason why Bradley wants this Munster Blood is kind of a normal reason. He just wants to not be bullied anymore. He wants to get bigger because of that and like you can kind of understand that and I was like huh actually that's kind of really endearing but then Bradley's just a really annoying character anyway and he never learns his lesson so it's just like well that's kind of that out of the way but like I understood his reasoning and I kind of give it credit for that, but it was still a terrible book. Out of five, it gets like a one star, but like an overall core pile rating, it gets a 2.57. 2.57 out of 10, so it's a little bit better than Monster Blood 4, but still one of the worst Monster Blood books. And nothing really happened, he got bigger, so what? It gets resolved so easily and quickly, so it doesn't even matter. And the reason why he gets smaller is because this was a sample 12 hour version of Monster Blood, and yet he wasn't affected by the Monster Blood for 12 hours. It was more like two. It was like two hours he was affected by this Monster Blood. But just like, it wasn't Monster Blood 2 or 3, where it was literally such a retcon because the Monster Blood just expired. It just so happened that it expired at right that moment. I'm like, oh God, like this is why Monster Blood is shit. It makes no sense. It gets resolved so easily every single time. It's not scary. Just give up the Monster Blood series, please. I beg, I beg. But yeah, Smart does end up getting to Horrorland. We are back with Billy and Sheena as well. They're trying to get Sheena to become visible again. We get more of a backstory with Byron and how he tries to help them. But then we also have the story of Brittany and Molly being missing still. And they get seen in this like, kind of like mirror, this like kind of magic mirror thing and they're on this carousel that's covered in flames. So like, it's very intriguing. I love the kind of Horrorland aspect of it, but it couldn't save this book for me. It was still a really shit book. <laughs> The Scream of the Haunted Mask, as I mentioned at the start of this vlog, I think, <laughs> The Haunted Mask is my favourite Goosebumps book of all time. Of any series I've read so far, it's the best book in my opinion. So in terms of core power ratings, we have The Haunted Mask, the first one, with 8.57. Then The Haunted Mask 2 was 6.36. So I was a little bit concerned about this one because... The Haunted Mask 2, 6.36 is still a great rating, but it wasn't as good as the original one. I could see like how repetitive it had become. So I went into this thinking, oh, okay, I've got to lower my expectations for one and just hope that maybe it's a little bit better than The Haunted Mask 2. Unfortunately, I don't think it was, but we do have Carly Beth and Sabrina. They are back and they are our main characters and I love them as characters. They're some of my favorite Goosebumps characters and I think they still did a good job in this book as well. So they are actually taking a job on at this kind of farm. They look after kids and there is, this story, this ghost story of a barn where a lot of horses died and it killed the stable boy while he was there too. And that story was very spooky. There are some plot holes with it though coming up. There are some plot holes. But like that whole kind of story of the horses dying and being dead against the wall and you know stampeding and kicking the stable boy to death was like kind of like terrifying and gruesome but it turns out the reasons why the horses like freaked out was because of the haunted mask and the stable boy had put on the haunted mask and scared them. So one thing I don't quite understand is when this is set right because the original haunted mask story came out what in like 1992, 1993? So it should be the early 90s, right? Because Carly Beth is only 12 in this one. So we're still back in the 90s. So does that mean all of the Horrorland books are in the 90s because they all meet up in Horrorland? But that doesn't make sense because there's a lot of modern day technology in the kind of rest of the series. Like in one of the books, I can't remember which one it was from the first three, there's mention of a high definition television. And I believe those didn't exist in 1993. So I don't know if that's like a huge oversight because we have Carly Beth and Sabrina who should be living in 1993. And yet we have like modern day books that are probably set when these books were released around about 2008, 2009. So I'm confused with the timeline, 
quite a few plot holes and there's a big plot hole with the kind of ghost story as well like everybody knows uh, like from the legend of like what happened in the barn that the stable boy died during the horse endeavor and then we meet the grandson of that stable boy who died and the stable boy was the same age as this young boy so he was probably around about 12 when he died so how in the world does he have a grandson when he died at 12 that i don't understand that however however I also feel like R.L. Stein probably realised this as he was writing this because somehow out of nowhere it turns out that one of the side characters called Laura, she turns out to be the one who scared the horses and died in the barn, not the stable boy. But surely if the stable boy didn't die during that endeavour in the barn, which would have only happened what like 60 years ago maybe? Because if that boy Clark, whose grandfather was a stable boy, so it would have been like what 60 years before right, if he's his grandson right? So why does everyone say that the stable boy died? if he actually didn't die and it was somebody else called Laura. I don't get it because Clark's grandfather was definitely the stable boy. There was a photo of him from that time when he was a stable boy. We were told he was the one who died and everyone said he was the one who died. But yeah, it was Laura. Laura and she's the one who put on the mask and scared the horses and died. Like, where did Laura come from? And if Clark's grandfather didn't die in that barn, then why did everybody say he did? Because surely they would know because Clark is living and breathing. And even he would know if his grandfather had died in that stable. And he says he did. So like, what's going on? I, I don't get it. I feel like R.L. Stein wrote himself into a corner with that and realised, oh, hang on, he can't have a grandson because he died when he was 12. Let's make a new stable boy out of thin air. So that just didn't make sense. But we do have like the haunted mask barely really make an appearance in this as well. It's more about that ghost story and Laura being a ghost. So for that reason, this is like my least favourite Haunted Mask story at 5.86. And unfortunately, a bit worse than the Haunted Mask too. Still not wholly terrible though because I'm still engrossed by Carly Beth and Sabrina. I do like their story and I do like the ghost story of like the horses in the barn and how Carly Beth can hear them neighing and things. Like, that's quite spooky. And then Carly Beth and Sabrina do go to Horrorland. They meet Matt and Billy and they watch a magic show and Sheena reappears. But then they kind of all split up and Carly Beth and Sabrina end up in the werewolf village. So that's this story. Didn't live up to the haunted mask love that I wanted it to. But I made sure that my expectations were a little low anyway. So 5.86, not terrible, but definitely not good. <laughs> I hated this book so much. I think this is one of the lowest rated Goosebumps books I've ever rated. I'm gonna have to go through my entire list of every single Goosebumps book so far and see if it is at the bottom. I think there might be one that's lower down, I think. Oh, actually, actually, this has the same rating as Monster Blood 4. So I gave this one 2.14 and it will get a one star for sure. For absolutely sure, hated this. So this one is kind of a bit of a rip off of Attack of the Mutant. We have Robbie who, oh, I hated this so much. Robbie who has created these super villains. We have one that was called, I know one of them's Dr. Maniac because that's on the cover. But the other one's like the purple, purple rage, purple rage. And another one called like Scar Scarlet Scarlet? Yeah, the Scarlet Scarlet, like stupid. I know he's a child. I know he's a child. And I know this is like feeding his imagination, which I should have known very, very early on very early on, he said something about having an overactive imagination. So the first chapter, his family are going like camping and stuff, and we have Dr. Maniac, his comic book villain, come to life. And at the end of chapter one, Dr. Maniac is trying to make Robbie eat a dead squirrel. Start at chapter two. Hope I didn't confuse you. That last chapter was just a comic strip I drew. One of the things I, ugh, one of the things I absolutely hate is when we're told one thing and then we're immediately told that that's not true. I hate lies. I hate when R.L. Stein lies. And there are so many lies in this. There's two more lies, two more lies. And then at the end of chapter five, we have, it seems like Dr. Maniac, oh, he's come alive again. He's this comic book villain that Robbie's created. He's come alive again. And then start chapter six. Sam squinted at the screen as he read the newest comic strip on my laptop. Cool episode. Yes, you probably figured out that the adventure in the woods wasn't real. It was just another comic strip. <sighs> And at this point, I was like so fed up. I was like, please, no. But then I read on because I thought, okay, if Shadi they can't do it again, <sighs> fuck it, dude. The entire main story of Robbie is totally fake. Totally fake. So then his best friends get taken by the supervillains and Robbie has to save them. So he kind of goes on like, this little adventure to save them. And then they're all being kept at like this ice rink thing and the supervillains are making them skate for some reason. And then the ice melts and... I, I don't understand why that happened. Anyway, it turns out the Scarlet Scarlet and the Dr. Maniac, the people under the masks 
are his best friends. Like, oh my God, you've been missing, but you're actually the supervillains. Oh my God. And I thought that was actually pretty cool. I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Chapter 25. Mom and I were in my bedroom. Mom leaned over me with her hands on my shoulders, reading the comic strip on my laptop. It was a long story, the longest I had ever drawn. I called it Dr. Maniac versus Robbie Schwartz. And that was the last chapter of like the main story. It was all his fucking comic strip. Oh my God, like seriously, stories like this make me angry. They make me so angry because it's happened so many times in Goosebumps where it turned out that everything was actually fake. Nothing was actually real. And it's like, why waste my time? Why did you just waste my time with that? I hate it. Don't do that to me ever again. So yeah, Robbie ends up going to Horrorland, meets Carly Beth and Sabrina and nothing really that interesting happens to him. He does come across like this arcade where there's this game, a Dr. Maniac game. And he's like, how is my comic book creation a video game, whatever. And then he also comes across like the golden ticket that seems to like hypnotize him a bit. But we didn't really get a whole lot of development in his Horrorland section. So this whole book is garbage. In fact, it might be worse than Monster Blood 4. Okay, I'm changing my rating. One star, but a 2.00 in Copile. I'm changing it. I hated it. I hated it so much. I don't ever want to look at it again. So we started out pretty average, went into a pretty fantastic Goosebumps book, really lowered the bar, raised the bar slightly, but was still a little bit disappointing. And then we just went crashing down to the center of the fucking earth. So honestly, the first five Goosebumps books, what a goddamn roller coaster. R.L. Stein has no consistency. I need to stop. Like, I don't want to be negative. I never want to be negative in these Goosebumps videos. But honestly, there is gold. There is gold here. And I do love Goosebumps so much. But it frustrates the life out of me at the same time. Oh, like you can love and hate something at the same time. Honestly, I am so intrigued by the Horrorland aspect of it. But some of these standalone stories have left such a bad taste in my mouth. After five books, I'm scared of what's next in Goosebumps Horrorland. I think we're gonna play a game every time we read one of these books. And the game is, which previous Goosebumps book did Arwell Stein rip himself off from? This one was Ferry, Jekyll and Heidi from the series 2000 series. There were also... There were also hints of Stay Out of the Basement from the original series and Return of the Mummy from the original series, or was it The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb? I get them too mixed up sometimes. But anyway, no originality with this one at all. And I was really digging it to begin with because Abby and Peter, they're brother and sister, and they're actually a really good brother and sister dynamic. And I kind of like the way that they would have their water guns and like squirt one another and stuff. It was kind of fun. And they stay with their Granny V. She is the one who looks after them and she isn't well and that scares Abby and... So Granny V isn't well and that scares Abby and Peter because they think, oh no, we're gonna lose our granny and stuff. And that's like really heartfelt. Like that's quite an emotional kind of storyline for these kids to go through. And I love it when Aurel Stein gives us hints of like genuine characterization. Whereas nine times out of 10, his characters feel like cardboard cutouts of previous characters he's already written. So it was nice to have a little bit more dimension with Abby and Peter. So Granny V is going in for some tests and things. So Uncle Jonathan has to look after them and he hasn't seen them since they were a baby. So they don't really know who Uncle Jonathan is, but then they end up going to like the small village and they end up going to Uncle Jonathan's house and he's obsessed with like ancient Egypt. And this one gets like very Jekyll and Heidi because when the kids end up going to this town for the first time and they're waiting at the train station for Uncle Jonathan to pick them up, there is a woman called Annie who goes up to them and asks them where they're going and they say, oh, to Uncle Jonathan's house and she's like, oh no, you don't want to go up there. Listen to me, go back where you came from. You don't want to go up to that house. And that just gave me instant flashbacks to Jekyll and Heidi. Can't remember if that was a brother and sister in that one but I do remember that the kid or kids got to the place and I believe the main character meets a boy and this boy warns her of the house she's going to it's like oh no don't go there and stuff and like that kind of warning from a stranger as soon as they get there about the house was just so Jacqueline and Heidi. And even when Abby and Peter go into the house and stuff, again, I got senses of Jekyll and Heidi and stay out of the basement when they're not allowed to go into a certain room and things. So like that was like, fine and well. I thought, okay, whatever. I can see where this is totally going. But one huge thing as well that shows the huge plot hole of when this is actually set is that Peter is talking about his iPod. Now iPods, when they were first released, were in 2001. So the whole Carly Beth and Sabrina, and even Billy and Sheena from Deep Trouble, 
their stories were set in the very early 90s. So how are they in the same timeline as the new kids that were introduced to in the Goosebumps Horrorland series? Like, there's a huge part of me that's like, I can't overlook this. This is just like a huge oversight on R.L. Stein's part. Like, he's actually not a, a very good writer if he can't even keep his own timeline in check. Like, it just doesn't make sense. And then I feel like... We ended up going into ridiculous territory with this one. And again, like I was really digging the kind of relationship dynamic between the siblings. And I was really looking forward to seeing some more like ancient Egypt because I love ancient Egypt. And I love it when we get like some spooky mummy kind of stories. But this kind of went in the total opposite direction. So it turns out that Uncle Jonathan isn't their actual uncle. The woman who warned them at the train station is in on it with Uncle Jonathan. And there's also a housekeeper as well who's in on it. So bottom line is, the the fake Uncle Jonathan is actually from ancient Egypt. He's been living for 2,000 years and he's been eating the organs from inside the mummies for the last 2,000 years, keeping him alive. But he needs Abby and Peter's jet black hair in order to revitalize these mummies so that they can continue feeding off them. And now Tobu's gone for a shit. And you know what, Tobu? Apt. Very apt. So this is how like ridiculous the kind of forcing of the Abby and Peter into this dangerous situation is by having them be the object of the desire from the villain. It's crazy. So apparently the fake Uncle Jonathan is called Tutan Ra. He says, I saw your uncle in the village a few weeks ago. He was showing off pictures of you, pictures that your granny V had sent him. I saw your long black hair in the pictures. I almost started to drool. I knew that I needed your hair, needed it to live. So apparently Abby and Peter's hairs are the exact hair that Uncle Jonathan and his fellow ancient Egyptians need in order to keep these mummies alive so that they can stay alive. So he says, I need a special protein from the hair of certain people. Our supply is running low. It's so lucky you two came along. Yeah, you're telling me. It's very lucky. Is it anybody with jet black hair, long jet black hair? What is the deal there? Because you could get that off anyone, shall we? So there's huge plot holes in how R.L. Stein does these kind of reveals because then you're just like, well, hang on a minute. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, surely you could get that from anyone. It's like they see me get the camera out and they're like, right, how can we distract? How can we distract daddy from his job? Come here, you. Come here, you. Oh, I just love you so much. And also, hang on, back it up a little bit. I might be a little bit wrong on this, but I don't think I am because I Googled this. <laughs> so this is when we also get a little bit girl who cried monster because they say Uncle Jonathan, the fake Uncle Jonathan, eating the organs from inside the mummy. But weren't the organs removed from mummies? I think the only thing they left was the heart. But like he's eaten like intestines and livers and all of that. But weren't they removed from the mummy and put into jaws? Like, isn't that actually what happened to mummies back in that time? So like, how is he eating all of these organs and things, keeping him alive from these mummies when they shouldn't even be there in the first place? They should be in jaws. So I feel a little bit like Oral Stein didn't do his research here, which again proves just how bad of a writer he kind of is. And yeah, I'm so conflicted because I really loved, like, say, Creep from the Deep. I thought that was a great book. And yet we have stuff like this where it looks like, again, like, he probably just took a day to write it and didn't bother researching anything for it. And just had to come up with the most ridiculous of solutions or most ridiculous kind of ways to get the main characters to be put in danger. Their hair... They have jet black hair and they need a protein from their hair. There's so many other ways that he could have written this and made it so much more believable for one, which I know it's fantasy, it doesn't have to be, but like still, it could at least be a little bit believable. And two, it could have made it scarier. Ancient Egypt, mummies, you know, it's like, you could have done anything with that. And then we had that storyline of them being from like 2000 years ago. I'm sure that's a storyline that was in Return of the Mummy as well. I swear, R.R. Stein just pointed at Jekyll and Heidi, stay out of the basement and Return of the Mummy and even Girl Who Cried Monster and thought, let's mix these all together and see what we get. And that's exactly what I think this book is. And even when we get to Horrorland, so we do have Abby go to Horrorland by herself. Peter decides not to go. But the more we see of Horrorland, the more we realize just like how fake it is and how less scary it's becoming. And also like, why are these kids here without their parents? The only people who came with their parents were the very first two kids. Why is Abby by herself? Oh, also, okay, the end, right, the very end. So I kind of did like the end a little bit, but also didn't. So you know how I was saying like Granny V is like ill and stuff? And then at the very end, when Abby and Peter go back home to Granny V, they end up giving her some kind of part of the mummy so that when Granny V eats it, she will kind of become immortal. But they've just watched 
how the fake Uncle Jonathan died. Like, he was eaten off these mummy organs and he had to live off them forever. So where are they going to get more mummy organs from to keep their granny alive? And the way that they defeated the mummy was that they squirted water at him. <laughs> they squirted water at him and they also squirted this water at a cat called Cleopatra that turned to ash. So, like, what happens when Granny V takes a bath? What happens when she goes in the shower? Is she going to turn to ash? Is she going to die? Did they think this through? Have they just condemned their granny? Like, yeah, their granny is ill and it looks like she doesn't have very much longer to live, which is awful. But, like, they're kind of cursing her with this ancient Egyptian immortality that will kill her because they won't be able to get more mummy organs and keep them alive, keep these mummy organs alive, for Granny V to stay alive. You know? Like, it was a cool little ending, the fact that they sat Granny down, like, oh, he has something to eat, and she's like, oh, what is this, a liver? And, like, don't ask questions, just eat it. Like, that was a cool ending, but then when you think about the logistics of it, Granny V ain't staying alive for much longer. She's gonna take a bath, and she's gonna turn to ash. Or she's gonna die pretty much immediately because she won't have more mummy organs to feast on. So anyway, I did really enjoy this book. I gave it a 3.00 out of 10. Honestly, if this had been a bit more original, I would have enjoyed it more, but it's so hard to read these books and not say just how much R.R. Stein is ripping himself off. So honestly, points down. Points taken off for that. And even the Horrorland kind of section of this now has been a little bit repetitive. I mean, I'm still very intrigued to find out why they've all been invited, who invited them, how they got invited, how they know about the things that they've gone through. Like, is somebody watching them? You know, I just, I need to know these things. But I have zero faith in R.L. Stein that he's going to actually give me an answer that's going to be satisfying. I feel like it's going to be so utterly ridiculous, so out of nowhere, it'll not make any sense. So I'm kind of both excited to find out the reasonings behind them being invited as VIPs, but also I'm terrified because I genuinely think the answer is going to be a terrible answer. But I'm just going to have to read on to find out exactly if I'm right or wrong on that. Okay, so my friends Call Me Monster borrows a lot of elements from Creature Teacher and Calling All Creeps. But we do have Michael, who was introduced in the Horrorland segment of the previous book, and he is called Monster by his friends because he's a bit bigger than everyone, and he also has a really short temper. So he ends up breaking into Mrs. Hardesty's house, with his friends because they think breaking an entrance is acceptable to pull a prank, which honestly, again, like characters in Goosebumps books, main characters, they will break the law and not feel any shame about it. So Michael and his friends end up witnessing Mrs. Hardesty. She has this huge egg in her attic and she sits on it. <laughs> It is a little bit ridiculous. She sits on it and she is hatching a monster. I also got like little bits of Invasion of the Body Squeezers kind of feeling from this as well because it turns out that the monsters and things are being hatched by these kind of like alien people. Or I think they're kind of just like monsters themselves. I kind of got a little bit confused with that because we also have like a commander who turns out to be the principal who we thought was a good guy but turns out yeah he's the commander he is like the main bad guy and the main kind of plot of this is just the fact that Michael sees his teacher hatching this egg she has more monster babies and Michael sees this and she ends up turning him into a monster as well but only for like a little brief time and the way that they turn into monsters is by eating scrambled egg uh, so the way that Michael is transformed into a monster is just that he, well, Mrs. Hardesty sees him through the window, she invites him in, even though he's just witnessed what she's just done, and he goes in anyway and eats these eggs that she's made, even though he's just witnessed her eating them herself and turning it into a monster, and he does it and he's turned into a monster. It's very easy rectified if he just eats the eggs again, so that's a fine. And again, it goes way too ridiculous and huge plot holes abound. So in the confrontation with Mrs. Hardesty and Mr. Wong, who is the principal turned commander, the way that they're defeated is that in this giant egg that these monsters are born, there's kind of like an egg yolky kind of thing, right? So these monsters, they're born from this, right? And you can assume that maybe Mr. Wong and Mrs. Hardesty also come from that kind of ilk, because how else were they born as monsters? But we have Mr. Wong sitting on top of an egg, and Monster cracks the egg so that Mr. Wong falls in, except Mr. Wong can't swim. So he's in this egg yolk, in this egg that's in this living room, which obviously mustn't be that big 
I mean, it, it sounds big. It does sound like it's probably big because the monsters are apparently huge, but it must be small enough for it to, well, one, fit in the living room, and two, for Mr. Wong to get up on top of it without apparently any stairs or ladders. You would think that that would be mentioned if there was like stairs or ladders coming up to the top of this egg so that they can sit on these eggs. And honestly, the more I talk about it, the more I think, what the fuck was our sign on? So yeah, a monster makes Mr. Wong fall into it. So Mr. Wong's like, I can't swim, I can't swim. So Mrs. Hardesty ends up jumping in herself and she can't swim either. And then they both end up dying. That's it. That's pretty much the end. That's how they get defeated. You would assume that they would be able to kind of get out of it because it, it's just an egg. It's just an egg. And if they crack the egg, then surely the egg yolk must be coming out. It must be spilling out of this egg, right? So I don't get it. Especially since my monster also bashes the egg. Surely he must be at the bottom, right? He didn't just like suddenly fly to the top, bash the top of the egg, so only the top of the egg cracked where Mr. Wong was for him to fall in. He would have had to have cracked the egg on the side so that the split would have went up, made Mr. Wong fall in, but then surely the egg yolk must be pouring out of it. Surely, right? That, is that just me? Like, am I the only person saying all of these huge gaping plot holes in this Horrorland series? It seems like every single book. It doesn't make sense. Like, it just doesn't make sense. And I'm getting so frustrated and we're on what, book seven? Oh my god. I'm frustrated before this. But honestly, it took a lot longer for the original series and series 2000 for it to really frustrate me. And I genuinely thought that given the kind of new storyline with the Horrorland segments would breathe new life into it, make me enjoy these books more. But actually it's kind of not really helping. So this book gets a 3.14 rating and it's so low. It's, God, all of these ratings are like so low. Well, most of them anyway. I think there's only been two I've liked so far. But I'm struggling. I'm struggling guys. So the Horrorland section, it's starting to get a little bit repetitive now. I'm starting to get a little bit bored with it all. But we do have a bit more developments. We have a clue that maybe the mirrors, like if they find any, will help get them to this other park, which is apparently called Panic Park. But also I do love the fact that we had a little bit of a nod to Luke and Lizzie, who were the original protagonists of One Day at Horrorland. Yes, and yes, and yes, go back in the original series. And they got a little bit of a mention. They have a blog, which we don't get to read the rest of it, but it says that they are warning us in their blog. They, and then, they don't get further in. But I love the kind of nod to them. I like that a lot. But yeah, we do end up with Michael getting to Panic Park. So not a great book at all. And unfortunately, my enjoyment has nosedived. Why are these stories so stupid? Like, I get it. It's Goosebumps. It's kind of aimed for children. But I, I've said this so many times in my Goosebumps series that kids books can be smart and fun and engaging. But I feel like the Goosebumps Horrorland books are just not hitting it. They feel so sloppy and lazy. There's plot holes everywhere you cannot turn without seeing the plot hole. And I just feel like that eight years gap between the series 2000 and this one did absolutely no favors. So unfortunately, another like pretty bad Goosebumps book. Say Cheese and Die Screaming, one, I absolutely bloody love the name. The name is fantastic. It's just like how I liked Monster Blood for Breakfast as a title. And even like the Scream of the Haunted Mask, taking original titles and changing them up slightly, I love stuff like that. It's like, you know how the new Enchanted on Disney Plus is called Disenchanted? I love stuff like that. It's so good. But unfortunately, like the title's like the only good things about these books these days. But Say Cheese and Die Screaming, I did like this more than My Friends Called Me Monster, but only quite slightly. But this was definitely better than Say Cheese and Die Again. I hated that. That book, that's probably my least favorite Christmas book of all time. Whereas Say Cheese and Die, the very original first Say Cheese and Die book, I love that book. It's one of my favorite Christmas books. So Say Cheese and Die Screaming, I'm gonna give it a 3.86 because the premise was there, but it just didn't quite hit the heights of where it could have went. So in this one we follow Julie and she is in competition with a kind of a frenemy at school, David. They love taking photos and they do a lot of photography and they're usually in competition with one another about like taking photos and things. So Julie ends up coming across a camera at a garage sale but the person who's like selling it's like no no don't take it and then for some reason turns her back on her so she allows Julie to run off with it. Although it's the woman's daughter who goes to Julie and says, take it, get rid of it. But like the mother, she is like so distraught at seeing it and just like, no, no, that's not for sale. Then why didn't you take it off her? Why did you just let her walk away with it? Like, it just beggars belief. But anyway, Julie does take it and 
I love the premise of the evil camera, quite honestly. I love the fact that when you take a photograph, it kind of shows you like the very immediate future, something that goes wrong. So for instance, Julie's best friend, Rena, she gets a photo taken and her eyes are all red. They look evil. And then like moments later, her eyes start burning and like really burning to the point of like pure pain. She has to go to the hospital. So I kind of like stuff like that because it's very sinister. But yeah, we end up getting more series of events like that happening. But there are some things, again, that I wasn't really a big fan of. Such as Julie tries to get rid of this camera and for some reason it seems to keep coming back and she's like, why is this happening? And then it turns out that David, her competitor, was seeing her try and get rid of this camera and he kept putting it back, which honestly, just saying out loud, it doesn't sound that bad. But David says, who do you think was spying on you? I stayed up day and night. I watched you leave it in that little house and I watched you toss it in the pond. Who do you think returned it to you both times? So this happened before as well. I'm sure there was another character in another Goosebumps movie where for some reason another character was constantly watching them 24-7. Like, do you have a life? Like, you're a child. You're like 12 years old. You should be doing your homework. You should be at home. You know, don't you have a curfew? Don't you have bedtime? Why are you watching somebody else for 24 hours, day and night, he said, day and night? It doesn't make sense that he would be following her all of these places and breaking into her house to return it. Why did he do that? He says it's just to mess with her mind, but like, isn't that just like a little bit too extreme? Isn't it a bit too unbelievable that a 12 year old would stay out all night, all day and all night to watch somebody what, just to give her a camera back? Just to mess with her mind? It doesn't make sense. And another thing I absolutely hate with R.L. Stein's writing style, and it's the whole lie thing where he just like completely lies to your face. So end of chapter 21, a shill scream escaped my throat as I felt myself start to fall. And the thought flew through my mind, the camera has won. And then the very start of chapter 22, no. Oral Stein literally just tells us no to our face. What he just wrote is wrong. That He does that so often. He tells us point blank, no, that's not what happened. I get it. He's trying to make this false cliffhanger, but he does it so many times. He lies to our faces so many times. It's so frustrating and annoying. No, if you think I'm joking, no, just no. No, <laughs> that's not what happened. Oral sign, why? I love the ending of this one though, which is probably why I gave it like 3.86 in Copile instead of like a one star. It was a good idea. Julie thinks that she can destroy the evil camera by taking a photo of it, of its like itself kind of thing. So she puts it in front of a mirror and like kind of sets the the timer off thing so it'll take a photo of itself. But it turns out in the photo, there's actually two cameras. So like, she's kind of like fucked that up. And that's like hilarious, but also like, it was a good idea, I think. So, you know, props for that. I think finally a smart decision from a character. It does, you know, blow up. That is like the cliffhanger, two evil cameras instead of one. But like, props for trying, you know? And then we do get to Horrorland. And one thing I'm not a big fan of this Horrorland section is that we usually have a big cliffhanger at the end of the main story. And then we get to Horrorland, like randomly everything's kind of like tied up and wrapped up and, and we don't ever get to say like the conclusion of that cliffhanger. And I don't even think the whole two camera thing is mentioned in the section that Judy's in Horrorland. Some other books, they do give you like a line of what happened after the cliffhanger. Just like, oh, turns out that everything was fine and the end kind of thing. And then goes into the Horrorland storyline. So it's just like, there's so much lazy storytelling in these that I'm honestly, I'm so annoyed and I've got so many more books to go. But also I'm staying positive because I have read the, like the next two as well. And I see the Horrorland storyline going in a, a, a direction and I'm looking forward to seeing how the Horrorland storyline develops rather than these individual storylines because the individual storylines nine times out of ten are rather shit and ripped off from another Goosebumps book. This one was not amazing. So unfortunately, a low rating. Welcome to Cam Slither. You know, welcome to Cam Nightmare. Uh, Return of Ghost Camp, other camp stories. I haven't been the biggest fan of the camp stories. I think there's only been like one or two that I've actually enjoyed because again, copy and paste, you have shady camp counselors, you have people pulling pranks. Usually it involves a snake. And guess what this one is? Welcome to Camp Slither. Although in this, the camp is called Camp Hither. People call it Slither because of the stories of snakes. So we follow Boone and Heather and their brother and sister. And for some reason, like every single sibling dynamic in the Horrorland series so far, the siblings have been 12 and 10. Every single one, 12 in 10. So Boone and Heather, the other and sister, and they're going to Camp Hither for summer. So this is when it's like very welcome to Camp Nightmare, but we do meet Roddy and he is a, somebody they meet, like a new friend. And he ends up, well, disappearing out of nowhere. And his stuff ends up getting taken from where he was staying. The exact same thing happens in Welcome to Camp Nightmare. I believe it happened in, was it Camp, 
Cold Lake as well, maybe Return of Ghost Camp, Camp Jolly Jam, all of the camp stories, all the fucking camp stories, the same, a camp mate goes missing, their stuff gets removed. Every single time that has happened. And then you have the counsellors being like, I don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 every single time. So it turns out the Dr. Crawler and like camp counsellors are actually snakes and they've been injected with snake DNA. But also the kids, when they arrived, they got sprayed with like this orange spray, which had snake DNA. So if the kids get shocked at the exact right frequency, they will turn into a snake. So I just love how specific a lot of the kind of things are in Goosebumps. So we had this specific protein in the black hair in Who's Your Mummy? And in this, they get turned into snakes if they get shocked at an exact frequency. So I didn't really find that scary whatsoever. I do have a little bit of a phobia of snakes, but I don't think Arvel Stein utilized that fear very well in this. And it could have, he could have done that, but I just feel like he didn't go that extra mile for building that atmosphere. And he can do it, he can do it. I thought Creep from the Deep was a fantastically atmospheric book and was very claustrophobic. And he could, really could have built up on the phobia of snakes in this, had he have like paid a bit more attention to it. But he just didn't really. And I really hate when villains kill themselves, essentially. So Dr. Crawler ends up accidentally biting himself and killing himself. So it's like, what do the main characters even have to do? They just have to stand there and let everything happen to them, which is the majority of Goosebumps books. The main characters sit back, relax, and just like, right, let's let this plot play out. We've seen it before in the first four seasons of Goosebumps, so we kind of know what's gonna happen. So we might as well just not do anything. That's exactly what these main characters are thinking, probably. And then we do get the Horrorland set Section Boone goes to Horrorland and again we get a little bit repetitive with it. They escape from horrors. Uh, well Boone meets the other guys and then they escape from the horrors. They decide to go on a ride and then they bum into the horrors and then escape again. And you know it's just like it seems to be like a back and forth kind of thing that we're seeing a bit far too much of so far. But again I'm not hating it too much because I do know we're probably heading towards something. I'm getting there. I'm almost there. So I did find the Horrorland section of this one to be a bit lackluster. And I'm not a huge fan of the fact that Dr. Maniac and the Purple Rage or whatever is part of the Horrorland section now as well. I honestly could do without all of that and just keep it to the horrors. But at this point I'm learning too much about the horrors. I'm seeing too much behind the scenes of the horrors and I'm realizing it's not scary. It's not scary anymore. Horrorland used to be scary and it's just not anymore. So I don't know, I might just be being ratty for no reason. And I don't want to like keep hating on Goosebumps, I swear. I still love Goosebumps so much, but I just don't know if I have anything really positive anymore to say about it. But I do hope there's going to be another creep from the deep soon. But unfortunately, the next book doesn't even do it for me either. So in Core Pile, this one slipped down to 2.71. It's definitely one of my least favourites because, again, it's a copy and paste storyline. None of it was scary. And yeah, I just got a bit sick of reading it. Help, we have strange powers. You know it's gonna be a not great book when even the blurb gets something wrong. And it says on the blurb, Jillian and Jackson freak out when they suddenly can read people's thoughts. However, only Jillian gets the power of telepathy, Jackson gets telekinesis. He can move objects with his mind and Jillian can read people's thoughts. So that's already wrong. <laughs> the blurb is already wrong. It just shows you how unprepared and sloppy releasing these Goosebumps books were. And a huge part of me blames Scholastic. I genuinely think they barely gave any time and attention to it. Did this series have an editor? Or did they just trust R.L. Stein enough to be like, okay, give us your first draft and we'll publish it like that? I just don't understand. But anyway, we do follow Jackson and Jillian and they get special powers. They go and say this animatronic fortune teller called Madame Doom and she brings out a fortune saying welcome to Horrorland and I like the fact that we kind of had that mention very early on in the book because every single story so far has been just the singular story and then Horrorland but in this one we had like that hint of Horrorland to begin with and I like that. I'm grasping at straws here are things I like. I got a little bit of was it Egg Monsters from Mars vibes from this because, yeah, oh, wait, was it my best friend isn't, no, How I Learned to Fly, I think, maybe? I got that feeling from it too, because we have Jackson and Jillian, they've got their powers and whatnot. Oh, what about brain juices? Maybe brain juice? When they drink that potion thing and become, like, really smart. And so Jackson and Jillian, they end up waking up in a lab, and they meet a scientist called Inspector Cranium. We also learn of the Institute that will be watching these kids because Jackson and Jillian, they convince the scientists that they don't have powers because adults are dumb in the Goosebumps series. Adults are dumb and worthless and they shouldn't even be there to begin with because honestly, what's the point? What's the point of having them there? Parents? 
useless. Adults, useless. That is just Goosebumps wrapped up for you. So Jackson and Jillian also have a couple of friends called Dina and Artie, and they also have special powers, which we don't find out until around about the end. And they end up coming against Inspector Cranium and um, was it Artie? I think it was Artie who reverted Inspector Cranium to become a baby. So that's the, the villain defeated. So this one was a pretty boring like for a Goosebumps book. Not scary in the slightest. And you might be saying, oh, but Goosebumps isn't always scary. It's not supposed to be scary. An all new, all terrifying series from the Master of Fright. And I haven't been scared since book two. Not a whole lot to write home about. It didn't infuriate me. So I've given it a 3.29 as a rating. So better than the previous one. Not as good as Say Cheese and Die Screaming. But actually what I did enjoy more was the Horrorland section of this part because we love ourselves a cameo appearance. But although to begin with, I was thinking, no, no, no. When Jackson and Jillian are there, they run into Inspector Cranium and it's kind of something I expected at this point. Like, I'm like, how has he come back? But I feel like that's going to be explained, hopefully, in a really satisfying way. Because it seems like every kid who's been invited there, the villains that they've been terrorised by also kind of appear there too. Almost as if, like, they're all out to get revenge on these kids. And that's probably what the reason is, Oral Stein. So, Jackson and Jillian, they do meet the other guys, and they end up coming across a room of mirrors, and half of them get to go through the mirrors, and the other half gets stuck in Horrorland. It's then we get to meet Luke and Lizzie from the very first Horrorland book, which I was like, eh, I kind of like seeing them again. Even though Return to Horrorland in series 2000 wasn't that great. But seeing them as characters, I do enjoy. But again, it does bring the timeline of when these books are supposed to be set to a grinding halt because I can't wrap my head around how we are set in the same time. But we do have a pretty good cliffhanger that's made me quite excited to read the next book actually. And that is Luke and Lizzie, they are saying to the kids that they're going to help. But then Gillian reads Lizzie's mind and says that that's not exactly the case. Because Lizzie says, we don't work for the horrors, we're trying to help you. We really think you will be safer here in Horrorland because they're trying to stop them from getting to the other park. And that reminds me, at the end of Return of Horrorland, didn't Luke and Lizzie and their friend get to the other park and it turns out that park is a bad park. And that's like the cliffhanger of that book. I need to look back into that actually. But yeah, Carly Beth asks Jillian, can you read Lizzie's mind? And then Jillian says, she's lying. Don't deny it, you're lying. And that's kind of like the cliffhanger. Why are Luke and Lizzie lying to the kids? Aren't they supposed to be the good guys? So interesting stuff, interesting development. And I think that's what made it go above a three in Copile rather than under a three, so. Again, I'm clutching at straws here. But I do think that was a pretty good cliffhanger for the book. So that's another five books down, two days down as well. So we're on track to finish the series on time. And yet again, I've started filming and my cats are going mad. They're going mental. Tobu, do you not want to like lie down for just a second? No. <laughs> I should have filmed my update on the next five Horrorland books last night after my true crime and wine night with my patrons. But by that point, I was a little bit tipsy off the wine. I kind of just wanted to put my feet up and watch something and put books away. I didn't want to talk about books. So here I am this morning, kind of happy that I will definitely be finishing the Horrorland series today and starting the whole of Horror series. I'm ready for this to be over, in all honesty. In this little bundle here, I have a book that's not too bad, and then I also have what is probably my least favourite Goosebumps book of all time. So starting off with Escape from Horrorland, this one changes up the kind of formula that we've been used to with the previous like 10 Horrorland books. So we don't really follow like a new kind of character or like a, a very old character from years and years ago, only for them to end up in Horrorland in the end portion of it called Enter Horrorland. Instead, we are just in Horrorland for this book and the next one as well. Now I totally understand why the first 12 books are called one arc and the last seven books in the Horrorland series is a second arc. So this book, I think, rips off The Haunted School quite a lot. So we have, you know, Luke and Lizzie. At the end of the previous book, it seems like maybe they're betraying the VIPs, the kids. And then Byron comes along and gets them to go to the, was it the Hall of Mirrors? and gets them to go into Panic Park. But when they get to Panic Park, everything is in grayscale and there are shadow people kind of things all around. And it just reminded me of the Haunted School and I love the Haunted School. So part of me was like, oh, 
do you really have to rip that off? While this book definitely wasn't amazing, and again, I think the writing style was very lacklustre, what I did like about it though, was that we had elements from the VIP's previous stories coming into it, so that each of them kind of had, well, not all of them, but like each of them had a sort of part to play in the unfolding of events in this book. So we have like the giant eggs return from My Friends Call Me Monster, so that Michael can use his knowledge of the eggs to defeat the monsters and then same with like Carly Beth and the haunted mask you know she puts it on she tears up the other haunted masks and then Sabrina knowing that an act of love will save her kisses Carly Beth on the cheek and the haunted mask is defeated so even though a lot of it was kind of easy in that respect it really does show that the characters have actually learned something from their past adventures and are using it and I honestly I, I felt appreciative of that fact I thought okay we're kind of getting somewhere and like the characters are learning and growing and that's what I love to see in characters honestly there was quite a bit of character growth and then we do kind of get a face off at the end with the creator of Panic Park because Panic Park was a park that existed in like the 70s and then it like disappeared and I kind of like that story of Panic Park and the fact that the reason why the VIPs or the kids are there is because the, oh, actually was it revealed in this one or the next one? I think it's actually the next one. Okay, so I'll not mention it until the next one then because I think it's the next one. I kind of got the blurred together. But I do remember this one has like a lot of running around, a lot of face and past foes and defeating them and some kind of interesting developments with Byron and you know how like Jillian can read people's minds and that's how they thought that Luke and Lizzie were going to betray them because Jillian read their mind and was like, no, they're lying. Horrorland is worse than Panic Park or whatever and they just don't want us to go to Panic Park and that kind of whole thing. And Jillian, she read the mind of Byron like in the previous book and said, oh, he's telling the truth and stuff. And then she says like, oh, I can't read the mind of horrors, but yet she absolutely can because she read the mind of Byron. So like that was a little bit weird, but Lizzie kind of points that out. She says like, wait, what the hell? You definitely read Byron's mind, so you can read Horror's mind, so... Hmm? And it leaves an impression of who do you trust? Do you trust Byron? Do you trust Gillian? It's, and it's just kind of weird, and I kind of like the idea of not being able to know and who to trust. So I gave this one a rating of 4.71. It seems quite low, but it's the highest rating since The Scream of the Haunted Mask. So, like, improvement. It was definitely improvement. It was a step in the right direction of getting answers in this first arc of Horrorland. And then The Streets of Panic Park wraps up that kind of first storyline of why the VIPs are there and like how are they going to escape and like what's going to happen. And I found this one rather exciting, like a lot happens and maybe a little bit too much. I feel like R.L. Stein didn't really have a good handle of all of these characters because there's like what, like 12, 13, 14 main characters that we're following. And you can tell R.L. Stein is like trying to give each one of them attention, but in doing so, he makes us like kind of a bit of a clusterfuck of narrative that you just don't really know where to to look half the time. It does make it exciting though and I still give it a pretty decent rating of 5.43. Again, the highest since The Scream of the Haunted Mask. So I thought this was a pretty good conclusion to the Horrorland series. I was really worried, really, really worried that Oral Stein would mess it up and it would be, I mean, parts of it is pretty ridiculous, but you know, it, it's, it's fine really. And this kind of feels a little bit like The Avengers, but for Goosebumps as well. So I really enjoyed saying that because you had our heroes they end up having to kind of join forces with the villains that they've kind of faced in the past. And in a little bit like Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, I don't know why that just popped in my head. But yeah, the Menace, the main villain who tried to get them to Panic Park and has got them in Panic Park and wants them to stay forever, he's kind of betraying the villains as well. So the heroes and the villains have to like kind of team up against the Menace. And that was like actually pretty awesome. Like I really did like that. We also got an explanation that the reason Panic Park disappeared was because the fear meter went too high. So then, yeah, the, the park just disappeared. So the menace has this kind of device that's called the fear meter and he needs the kids' fear to get to 100 in order for the park to reappear because that's like his ultimate goal is to bring Panic Park back. Which, you know, is like a pretty decent storyline actually. Like I was rather engrossed in that. And yeah, so he's trying to like scare these kids to get the meter up to 100. So again, there's a lot of running around Around. There's a lot of trying to escape and then getting back into the kind of pitfalls of the characters doing something stupid and getting back to danger and you know kind of like circle repetitiveness not gonna lie but again like there was just like a lot of characters to follow so a lot of it didn't really get soaked in because of that. Oh play nice. 
So a lot of exciting things do happen and I do appreciate this one for wrapping up the first arc of the Goosebumps Horrorland series. I mean we still have seven books to go but I feel like this could have definitely ended the Horrorland series in general. Like this would have been a good place to end it on. For some reason R.L. Stein was like no let's write more. <laughs> So be careful what you wish for. Sorry, sorry, when the ghost dog howls. This one starts the new arc in Goosebumps Horrorland. And after reading the next two as well, I totally understand what the arc is doing. So I was kind of wondering like, oh, why is it still called Goosebumps Horrorland if the kids aren't gonna be in Horrorland by the end of it? Well, it turns out that the kids at the start of each of these second dog books that I've read anyway, the kids start off in Horrorland and then they end up coming across Chile's gift shop and they each leave with something. So in this one, we follow Andy and Lexi and Andy ends up getting this kind of tooth that grants wishes. If you read Be Careful What You Wish For, you don't really need to read this book quite honestly because Andy ends up taking it home and then he and Lexi, his friend, and Lexi was so annoying. You always get like really super annoying Goosebumps characters that you honestly wish were dead, like you hate them that much. And Lexi was no different in this, like she was so annoying. But I don't think anyone can come close to the sister in the Who Clock of Doom. But anyway, a good angle of this was that when he makes wishes and things, the ghost of the dog that the um, tooth belonged to would hunt them down or something. So we kind of get that sense of foreboding on the outside of it. Like you kind of expect this ghost dog to appear. I mean, if R.L. Stein was a better writer, I feel like you would have felt that tension throughout and like that fear throughout, but you don't really. This falls down the same pitfalls of be careful what you wish for, where characters just act so stupid. And you just think if you just had like a little sliver of common sense, you wouldn't get in this shit. And honestly, the majority of this book is just Andy dropping the goddamn tooth and having to go back to get it. Like that seems to be like the recurring theme of this book. I did get kind of hints of the barking ghost in this too, but it definitely felt way more like be careful what you wish for. So I don't really have too much more to say about this other than some of the atmosphere did feel pretty good. So I gave this one a rating of 4.57 which I think is still a pretty decent rating. Like for now, for Goosebumps, I feel like the average of a rating for this one that's considered good is four out of 10. So 4.57 is above average for Goosebumps. And then as part of this arc, which I'm also saying as a kind of recurring theme so that we can probably get to a sort of big conclusion in book 19, which is the final book in the Goosebumps Horrorland series, is that every single time they uh, that is that every single time a main character gets, you know, that kind of gift from the gift shop at Dr. Chiller's in Horrorland, he gives them a, like, a little horror, like, he gives them the gift for free, and then he gives them, like, this, like, little horror figurine that, at the end of the book, there's always an epilogue, and the horror glows, and it transports the kid back to Horrorland, and Chiller is like, okay, now it's time to pay your debt, kind of thing. So that's happened so far in, like, these ones, so I, I guess that is the kind of recurring theme for the second arc, for Horrorland 2 and I don't hate it like I'm intrigued I'm interested I do kind of like the Horrorland angle of that in that it's kind of more tied to a specific person to begin with like who is Chiller like why is he doing this like what does he want so having that rather than it being kind of a far too vague kind of thing that it was in the first arc where it seemed like Horrorland was just the main story but then Horrorland turned out to like not really be scary it just all turned out to be fake kind of thing like this one has definitely grabbed my attention a bit more so already great start to the second arc for Horrorland but unfortunately it goes way downhill for the next one <laughs> Monster Blood 2, sorry, sorry, Little Shop of Hamsters. This one I think is my least favorite Goosebumps book of all time so far. Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, absolutely appallingly written. And again, I'm surprised R.L. Stein hasn't sued himself for copyright. This is legit just Monster Blood 2. Okay, I made a big mess. When I was talking about the best friend, she's called Marnie in this one. It's Lexi in this one. It's Marnie who's super annoying. I, for some reason I mixed her up with Lexi in this. When you've got so many names to try and remember, mistakes happen. So in this one we follow Sam and Lexi and Sam really wants a pet. And in Horrorland in Jonathan Chiller's gift shop, he comes across this Instagram pet thing. And again, Jonathan Chiller gives him it along with the horror figurine. When he's back home, he comes across a shop called Little Shop of Hamsters, which I do like the title of that. Like it's kind of a clever play on words with the Little Shop of Horrors thing. But yeah, he comes across this little pet shop and Lexi, the little kleptomaniac, steals one of the hamsters and gives it to Sam. But Sam takes the hamster back to the shop. So that's Good, that's good, Sam. Pat on the back for a main character that does something right. He takes it back and he ends up getting a job at that shop and he... 
things happen. And he accidentally kind of like drops the Insta Grow thing into the hamster cage. And then a little bit later on when the hamsters becomes massive. And if that reminds you of anything, Monster Blood 2. We had a fight with a giant hamster in Monster Blood 2. It's literally exactly the same essentially. And the same thing happens where, I think it was in Monster Blood 2, when the hamster just suddenly become small again because the monster blood expired. And the kind of same thing happens here, the Instagram pets thing just like runs out of time. Like apparently it can only be huge for a certain amount of time. But, like honestly, what's so scary about things getting bigger? You know, we saw that as well in Monster Blood for Breakfast. It just wasn't scary and we've just kind of substituted the monster blood for insta grow pets. And anyway, so we had Sam take some himself so that he can become huge and so that he can fight this hamster. But like, shouldn't it only work on pets? Like, shouldn't it only work on animals? I, I don't get that. And that's essentially all that happens in this. We had a fight with a giant hamster that's already happened in the series. Like, did our sign forget that's already happened? Like, I'm so perplexed and it's just not one ounce of this book was scary. Not one single ounce. There wasn't even any atmosphere to it. And the storyline itself was just so pitiful and annoying. I just hated it. Honestly, the ending infuriated me. So there's also this kind of thing called Vito Vigo or something. It's kind of like a, a solution that makes people more aggressive and like foam at the mouth and stuff or like the hamsters and stuff. And at the end, it seems like Lexi has taken quite a lot of it. And the end in paragraph says, she slashed her fingernails in the air, clawing furiously. Then she leaped high and threw herself on me, scratching and growling and sank her teeth deep into my neck. And then we go into the epilogue. I staggered home. The bite on my neck wasn't as bad as I thought. I covered it with the plaster. Apparently sinking your teeth deep into somebody's neck after we've seen how that bit of Vigo, whatever shit it was, how that makes people aggressive in almost like kind of rabies kind of style way. And yet he's absolutely fine. He just put a plaster on it. Excuse- Honestly, R.L. Stein treats his readers like they're fucking dumb. He really, really does. And I'm getting really annoyed at him. <laughs> and just like we saw in When the Ghost Dog Howls, the main character sees his little horror figurine and gets transported back to Horrorland, where he is face to face with Jonathan Chiller. And Jonathan Chiller says, it's time to wait for the others to arrive. So he's waiting for more characters to come. It feels a little bit like that whole VIP thing in the first arc. And we have like these characters having to come back to pay their debts for taking something for free from his gift shop. So I gave this one 1.43. So that's like shockingly low. I believe that's the lowest core pile rating for any Goosebumps book yet. And I'm honestly not surprised. <laughs> so having said that, if you're like really annoyed with me right now because I'm just being overwhelmingly negative, I will tell you that the next book was definitely better. So A Night in Terror, sorry, um, The Headless, Go oh my God, I've got it wrong again. So Heads You Lose, this one definitely felt like A Night in Terror Tower meets The Headless Ghost. But I kind of still enjoyed it so much. I thought the atmosphere was pretty good. So I wasn't too mad at this really because A Night in Terror Tower is one of my favourite Goosebumps books of all time. And The Headless Ghost was a really good ghost story even if I think they found the head far too easily. And like the same kind of goes in this one as well. So we follow Jessica and Ryan and in Jonathan Chiller's gift shop and Jessica ends up getting a coin that will always land on heads no matter what. So it's kind of like a bit of a trick coin. So she takes it back home, she tries to use it against like bullies and things. And then when she uses it on like the playground, she and Ryan start to feel a little bit dizzy. And then when they kind of wake up, they're transported back into the medieval past. Ding, 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 a night in Terror Tower. And I don't mind that because it's a good storyline. And you know, if R.L. Stein wants to use anything again, if he wants to recycle storylines, then a night in Terror Tower is a good one to use because he does have more avenues to explore. However, he decides to go another avenue and that's to repeat kind of what he did in The Headless Ghost. So in this one, Jessica and Ryan are accused of beheading the prince and the prince is like still kind of walking around and stuff and he's trying to find like his head, which again, is like The Headless Ghost. So Jessica and Ryan are like imprisoned and stuff. They escape, they end up finding the head and well, they find a different head at first and then they have to like escape again and then they find the head and the prince gets his head back and it's all fine and well. But I do kind of like, and again, this just proves that R.L. Stein can write somewhat and he does have some like atmospheric moments in this and like a little bit gothic moments. And I know he can't do it, but for some reason he decides to write a lot of shit. So just like the other stories, it is really just like a lot of running around and trying to escape people and I guess not really a whole lot happens outside of like the main storyline and like the main plot, 
which again it kind of borrows from other Goosebumps stories. And then we get to the epilogue where Jessica gets transported back to Horrorland and Jonathan Chiller's like, time for you to pay. And again, like, it's starting to feel like a little bit repetitive now, but at the same time, that only lasts like two pages. The epilogues are always like very, very short. So it's not like the Horrorland stories where the end to Horrorland sections were like nine or 10 chapters. This is just like two pages, so I can forgive it for that. And it's still got my intrigue. I still want to know what Jonathan Chiller wants. I think this one did a pretty good job. And I kind of have to overlook the fact that we are just totally ignoring the fact that these storylines have been done before. So I did end up giving this one 4.86. So not quite as good as Streets of Panic Park and the batch that I just mentioned, but it is one of the better of the last five I've read. I think it's time for me to go in the shower and start the next five books, which means I will close out the Goosebumps Horrorland series and start the whole of horror series. <sighs> Nearly there. Nearly there. Well, we have finished one main Goosebumps series and started the next. So what did I think of the final four Horrorland books? Did they get better? Did it end the Horrorland series on a high note? Well, you're just gonna have to wait and find out. <laughs> In this one, we follow Meg and her brother Chris, and they end up taking home a doll, like a little doll thing that looks like an alien, from Jonathan Chiller's gift shop. This is set during Halloween, and before long, they end up meeting this like alien thing called Bim. Bim is part of an alien race called the Weirdos. Don't ask me why. <laughs> and essentially, he kind of in a bit of a slappy ass kind of way, almost turns Meg and Chris into like his kind of slaves. Like he demands them to do loads of different things. Things like, you know, like scratching his back, even though like his back is absolutely gross. And he has like a really short temper. He acts like a right brat. And he, I mean, he's not scary. He's a little alien that is like a child. When Bim goes a little bit out of control, Meg ends up giving him the little like toy thing the alien doll whatever thing that Jonathan Chiller gave her and gives it to him and he's like oh I remember why I was down on earth it was because I was trying to find my lost toy which this happens to be it and the day is saved but then this kind of just goes on for even a bit longer I don't understand why this is as long as it is like this is the longest Goosebumps book I've ever read it's over 200 pages and usually they've been around about like 130 up to this point with some of them hitting around about like 140 and then the second half of this book kind of turns into a, a a strange kind of and I guess it fits the title of the book like quite weird kind of little intermission almost like it's very uneven but Meg ends up going back to Horrorland and Jonathan Chiller he he needs her to prove to him to everyone that she is Meg and there is like another robotic Meg running around and we don't know who it is a little bit stay out the basement-esque it's a little bit like Sugar on Shock Street almost but overall it wasn't amazing like none of them are but it got a 4.14 it's not terrible and it's a little bit above the average of what I've given the Horrorland series and it's one that does kind of encapture some of the Halloween essence but a book that really does Halloween a lot better, in fact, two books that do Halloween a lot better are Headless Halloween and Attack of the Graveyard Ghouls from the Series 2000 series. Headless Halloween was definitely set during Halloween. Can't really remember if Attack of the Graveyard Ghouls was, but I remember they came out one after the other around Halloween time. So that might be why I'm thinking of like Halloween and associating it with Halloween. And I'm just like done. <laughs> I'm so done. This is a part of the Goosebumps vlog experience where I'm getting towards the end of the series and I'm repeating myself because R.L. Stein repeats himself and I get fed up, I end up not having any fun anymore. But I did have high hopes for this one because it says like special edition, it's like kind of like a special kind of book in the series and it's the longest one ever, like of a Goosebumps book. So I genuinely was expecting something with a little bit more pizzazz, I guess. But no, it ended up becoming a little bit too weird. <laughs> so The Wizard of Ooze is, Another like absolutely diabolical one that rips off other ones in the past. So this one has a core pile of 2.29. Definite Attack of the Mutant and How I Learned to Fly vibes. And like there's literally a part where the main character is trying to learn how to fly. Anyway, we follow Marco and in Chiller's gift shop, he finds this rare comic for the Wizard of Ooze and he takes it home and there is a part in it that has like ways to learn how to be a superhero and how to get superpowers. So yeah, he tries these out. There's nothing kind of incredible about these kind of ways of getting these superpowers. Like one of them is getting water powers by literally filling a bathtub full of ice cubes and lying in it. There's just no creativity there whatsoever. And it turns out that you can get superpowers from it, but he only gets them for around about 10 
10 seconds at a time. And there are like a couple of like super villains who are out to get this special comic that's so rare. And again, like we even got like sort of like Dr. Maniac versus Robbie Schwartz vibes in this. And I've come to realize that I do not care about any of the superhero type books in the Goosebumps series. They always fall flat. They always try to mimic Attack of the Mutant in some way or other. And I don't understand why he has to keep recycling the kind of superhero storyline. Like, give me something new. If you want to do something with the superheroes, give me something new. But I do love the title though, because I love The Wizard of Oz. It's like one of my favorite films of all time. So like, the title was good. <laughs> and again, like, I think most of the titles for the Horrorland series are great, but I just feel like the books just let them down so much. And just like usual with the other ones in the last arc of the Horrorland series, Marco is transported to Chiller's gift shop at the end. Yeah, whoopee, whoopee. But definitely my least favorite in this last part of the arc. We actually know a little shop of hamsters is worse, but this is they're kind of down there with it. Okay, so with Happy New Year, I don't understand the timeline thing again. You know, I feel like R.L. Stein again hasn't planned any of this and has made a huge, you know, gaping plot hole because literally if you got two books before this, it's Halloween, right? And then two books later, it's Christmas and New Year. So with the running storyline of Jonathan Chiller taking these kids, does that mean he's had these kids kidnapped from the latter half of the Horrorland series for two months? Has he really waited that long to get the last couple of kids for his plan of action, which I will talk more about when I talk about the horror at House. But like the timeline again, Stein, Stein, did you write down what timelines you're supposed to be following here? Because again, there's no way that Carly Beth should be in the late 2000s and Billy and Sheena, there's no way. So like with this one as well, why is it Christmas and New Year when we just had Halloween two books ago? I mean, the name is fantastic. Again, Slappy New Year, love it. So I feel like Stein just really wanted to use that. So then he had to use the time frame of Christmas and New Year as the setting for this book. But like, make it make sense. Make it make sense. But then again, we fall into the huge trappings of this being exactly, exactly like the other living dummy books. This one gets a 2.86 in Core Pile and it follows Ray and his brother Brandon and they end up taking Slappy home from the gift shop. And just like in every other living dummy book, Slappy starts kind of causing trouble. But is it really Slappy? Is it somebody else who's controlling Slappy? Oh, wait, hang on. Someone just accidentally said the magic words that brought Slappy to life. Oh, but can it really bring him to life? Oh, but can it put him back to sleep? I don't know, because he seems to keep coming back to life anyway. Slappy New Year, more like Sloppy New Year. We literally get a rinse and repeat of like Night of the Living Dummy 2, Night of the Living Dummy 3, Bride of the Living Dummy, Revenge of the Living Dummy. Like, come on. And I do not need to see that storyline again. We even had, was it in Bride of the Living Dummy when the kids, the main characters, have Slappy in this like birthday party thing for like a whole group of children? And I think Slappy like terrorizes them or something or like, does he like throw paint on everyone or something or like, gets paint on everyone? And then in this one, the exact same thing happens. We have a new year party and there are kids there and Slappy throws paint pockets at these kids. And it's like, this exact climax happened in Bride of the Living Dummy. I genuinely think it's time to retire Slappy. It's time to let him rest, I think, because he's become such a joke and the entire Living Dummy series has become such a joke. And I just don't understand why we're still seeing Slappy two decades later if he's not gonna do anything new. The Slappy books have such potential as well because he can be a great villain. We just never get there. It's the age old problem with R.R. Stein. He has the ideas, the execution, he never sticks the land in. So getting to the last book in this arc and this series as a whole, the Horrorland series, it was far too quick and easy, very anticlimactic. I really wanted to enjoy this one more because again, we have like the conclusion of the mystery of Jonathan Chiller and why he's taking these kids. And it turns out, I mean, I kind of like the first half of this book. It's set in 1960 and we get a bit of backstory to Jonathan Chiller and essentially his dad doesn't really like love him that much and thinks he's useless. And Jonathan wants to prove that he can be a man. And so in order to do that, he kidnaps a whole bunch of children and yeah. <laughs> so just like the kind of climax of the first arc, we have a lot of running around with all the main characters. And also Meg is still here as well. So Meg, she was the protagonist of this one, right? But like she went home at the end of it. When she goes home at the very end, she's confronted with her robotic self. She goes back home in this. So why is she stuck again like nothing happened in this one? 
Like, did he forget the ending of his own story? Did he even write this? Like, seriously, I know sometimes R.R. Stein would get ghostwriters to write his Goosebumps books. Did he get someone to ghostwrite this one or this one and they just had no idea? Like, in the writer's room, nobody had any communication that Meg went home. She did her kind of role with Jonathan Chiller in this one and she played his games and went home. Anyway, back to the present day. In Jonathan Chiller, I don't know if I'm supposed to feel sorry for him. He says he's never had friends and so the kind of costumes and stuff that he's been wearing this entire series because every time the kind of characters have met like a secondary kind of character in Horrorland, it's been Jonathan Chiller in disguise. So like his disguises are like all there and stuff and they're his friends and so the way to defeat Jonathan Chiller was the kids putting the disguises on and Jonathan Chiller telling them to stop because he's never had friends. Yeah, they're putting on the costumes and he's saying, you can't do this, those are my friends, you can't, you can't. No, those are my friends, my only friends, you can't do this. You can't take my friends, you can't take my friends. So he promises to take them home if they take the costumes off. And that is how they defeat Jonathan Chiller. They just put on the costumes of his friends, his disguises, and Jonathan has a bit of a breakdown that they're his only friends and promises to send them back home. I mean, it is a little bit sad. It is quite sad, the fact that Jonathan Chiller thinks these disguises that are him are his only friends. Like, that is quite sad. But, like, such a weird and random way of wrapping up this storyline that's been going on for the past, like, seven books. And I'm perplexed at how it ended because, again, it was very anticlimactic, very easy. And, again, like, not really a whole lot happened in this, just, like, a lot of running around. And I'm really disappointed with the way that's ended. I have given this one a bit of a higher rating to the last book that I read. So this one has a 3.57 rating. <laughs> At this point, isn't awful, because it seems to be the norm. But I was expecting more. I really was. I was expecting a better conclusion to the kidnapping of these children. And he just wanted them to play games and stuff. But, like, I feel like it could have come across a lot better and I just don't think R.L. Stein really utilised that kind of need for friends very well because Jonathan Chiller never seemed to exactly want to befriend them and just terrorise them. So if he wanted friends, why didn't he, like, just... I don't know. Like, I feel like this could have been better done. So that's the end of the Horrorland series. I mean, I will wait until the very end of the video to do my proper ranking and tell you the series average for Horrorland as well, because I do have that running average for every series I've read so far for Goosebumps. It's not looking good for the Horrorland series. Without further ado, let's get into the Hall of Horror series, which is fortunately only six books long. And we start with a book that kind of rips off Cry of the Cat. <laughs> I've said it. Oh my god. Honestly, I will give a book five stars if I see zero inspiration from another Goosebumps book. I mean, it's fine to borrow some, like, elements and stuff, but, like, it's very cut and paste again. So the Hall of Horrors books, this kind of storyline for this is that we do have the Story Keeper, and he begins the book by saying kids come to him and tell him the stories that they've lived through, like a traumatic and scary experience, and he tells us the story of it kind of thing. So that's how the book starts, and then the very, very end, when we go back to the Hall of Horrors, he kind of starts to introduce the next story, so I kind of know the basic premise of this one from the ending of this one. So that's kind of the shtick for the Hall of Horrors series. And I do kind of like that angle. It kind of made me feel a little bit like, you know, on the Goosebumps TV show, when R.L. Stein would sometimes start an episode and be like, hello, I'm R.L. Stein. I read the Goosebumps books. You know, he does that whole thing. It kind of felt a little bit like that. And I, I like that. I do like being told a story. I like the idea that there is like a storyteller in Horrorland that keeps people's horrific and scary stories. And it's a, it's a neat idea. I do like the idea of it. So in this one, we follow Mikey and his friend Amanda. They agree to look after one of their neighbours, Black Cats. And she's called Bella. And she ends up getting out and gets run over and dies. And I was getting a bit flashbacks to the star cry of the cat when the main character ran over the cat. So they end up going to a place called Cat Heaven, which is a kind of pet shop. And there they see a cat that looks exactly like Bella and they steal it. That's right, they steal it. I don't know why, but a lot of characters in Goosebumps books, I mean, are terrible human beings, terrible kids, and are kleptomaniacs. Bet and a lot of people tell me, oh, it's just a children's book, but you know, children's books should be written well and have good characters. So after that, they take this new cat home and pass it off as Bella. Then this cat is kind of a little bit crazy and, you know, rips up furniture and stuff. And it's definitely not the same cat. It's a little bit 
terrorizing. There are moments where Maggie is at school and he can hear the cat. And again, that's exactly what happens in Cry of the Cat. I remember the main character would hear the cat at school and it was done so much better in Cry of the Cat. Like I really enjoy Cry of the Cat. This one pales in comparison to that. So we get the same kind of scares repeated as well. Like not just the story, but the same scenes and the same kind of ways of R.R. Stein is trying to scare you. So then it turns out that the cats that live in Cat Heaven are actually all dead and if they kind of leave the the shop, I'm trying to remember now, if they leave the shop they will try and reenact their death or something and if the person who isn't the owner takes them out of the shop then they will haunt them forever or something like that. I don't understand how Mikey beats them because in his mind he thinks and he does this, he lets the cats in Cat Heaven escape by using his mouse as leverage and gets them to reenact their deaths. But the whole point is that they're going to reenact their deaths if they leave the shop anyway. And he's like the mountain, he's not their owner. So he should be haunted by them forever. So how is him doing exactly what has been said all along, going to defeat them? And it does defeat them. I'm, I'm so confused by it. I'm like... Okay. It's very Pet cemetery esque as well, but you know, Cry of the Cat was also. So this one gets a straight 4.00 rating. A worse start to the series than The Horrorland was with Revenge of the Living Dummy. I just need a new storyline, honestly. And I'm hoping one of these ones in the next five books, the last five books I need to read for this vlog, hopefully one of these just has a story I haven't read yet. I'm getting sick of myself, honestly, at this point. I'm trying so hard to be positive, but Stein makes it impossible to give good feedback to these books. I feel more dumb for reading these. Like, I've lost brain cells reading this series. And the more Goosebumps series I read, the more brain cells I lose. So I mean, sometimes it's good to have like some pure dumb fun reading books, but these are just pure dumb at this point. There's like nothing fun in reading the same story five times. And then reading the next book where the story's also being read another five times before that as well. Ah, I just don't know how Stein's getting away with this. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know if anybody remembers this, the One Day at Horrorland game. I used to own this when I was a kid and I mean it's been lost, lost for years and years and years. So I went on eBay when I started filming this vlog and I didn't think that it would come during the time of me filming so I thought oh I'll not be able to show it in the vlog. But no it came, it came today from eBay so thank you so much eBay seller. It was so cheap and I can't even remember how you play it, but I actually have an idea of what I can do with my Goosebumps books. This is kind of like how I'm going to like set up my like Goosebumps collection. So I do have, well, if you haven't seen it, you probably wouldn't have. If this is your first video or if you've only seen the Goosebumps videos, you'll not know this. But this is like my middle grade aisle in my library. So all like my middle grade books are pretty much down here. Apart from my fear, it's so dark down here. I'll turn on the light. I do have my Fear Street books here and they're YA, so they're not exactly all middle grade. Kind of the same with Animorphs. I've got some Animorphs books down here and these are pretty much the only place that I can really have these books. But what I'm thinking of doing because I have uh, all of my Goosebumps books in the island in the middle of the, the library. So I have like all my original ones and then my series 2000. I only have some of the Give Yourself Goosebumps books there. But then I have my Horrorland and Hall of Horrors books here, but they're all over the place at the minute because I've been reading them. But what I'm thinking of doing is moving all of the Goosebumps books so that they're on this shelf here so then I can put, you know, the Horrorland game. I can build the, the theme park in that game and have it displayed up here so that I have like a whole like Goosebumps kind of shelf thing down here. I think it's going to look awesome. I think it'll look awesome. So I'm going to do that now, actually. I only have two of the Goosebumps Hall of Horrors books left to read, but I'm honestly just like, I want to break. <laughs> I want to break. So I'm going to set this up. And I'm gonna move the Goosebumps books in that section there. What do you think? Do you like the idea? I hope so, because it's gonna happen and you've got no choice in the matter. And I will show you how it turns out in like literally two seconds. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> I don't know if it looks any good to you guys, but uh, I think it looks pretty pretty good. I would put the game board down and then put these rides on because that's what you're supposed to do. There's a, a proper game board and you put the rides on it, you go around the board and stuff. Really fun game but obviously it's for display now, display purposes only. Unless somebody does want to play it with me then I guess I will 
you know, take it all down and, and play it and put it back. But yeah, so far, this is what it looks like on top of the Goosebumps shelves. Ooh. So yeah, I think it looks pretty good. Having Horrorland on the top. We have the, the Doom slide there. We have the Wheel of Fear there as well, which I've had to put a couple of candles behind because it keeps falling down. We have the Horror Bridge there with a horror on it. And this thing that's got its mouth wide open. So I think it looks awesome. And then yeah, we go down into the original Goosebumps books there. And then down again to the series 2000 books and the give yourself goosebumps books there and then i've put my horrorland books back on the shelf and then my hall of horrors books and i'll be able to put my most wanted books here and the slappy world books here when i finally get them so i think it looks absolutely awesome in fact my display is better than the actual books themselves <laughs> Who knew? But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I will be reading the last two books now and getting the series done. And I will be back with my final full wrap-up thoughts on everything Horrorland and Hall of Horrors and my rankings and everything very, very soon. So stick around for that. So I think my review on the last five books is going to be quite quick because... I'm just grateful it's over and I don't feel like I have a whole lot left to say. I've got nothing left to give. Mr. Stein has sucked everything out of me. Not in the way that sounds. Yep, the last five books read, so let's talk about the first book in this last batch. So in this one we follow Stephen and we get a little bit of... You know, I got some vibes of Attack of the Graveyard Ghouls a little bit from this one, but this one has that kind of shrinking, honey, I shrunk the kids kind of feel to it. So we follow Stephen, who is obsessed with magic and things, and he has two friends, Ava and Courtney, and they're kind of like his magician assistants. And Stephen, his teacher, Mr. Pinker, forces him to like eat these cookies like he's very intense and very weird and you're like why are you so intent on him eating these cookies like what's the deal there so nothing really happens from that but then Stephen ends up pulling like a sword prank on Ava and Courtney and they swear revenge and then they end up like spiking his water during one of his magician tricks in front of the school and he ends up kind of running out and then he suddenly starts to feel himself start to shrink and become tiny. I don't know what it is with R.L. Stein, but he seems to be obsessed with size. So in a lot of his books, protagonists end up getting huge or they end up becoming tiny. This happens a lot. So I didn't really find this wholly interesting or original. It was a bit of a surprise, the kind of twist in this, because you know, at first you think it might be Eva and Courtney who made him shrink, but when they reveal it was just vinegar they put in there, <laughs> it's so random this as well, and just like, how coincidental. So this bird kind of takes Stephen and drops him off in Mr. Pinker's house, just by chance, like that just happens. So then it looks like Mr. Pinker is the one who made him turn tiny, but again, that's like a red herring, and it turns out that... <laughs> this is just again like this is ridiculous but like I've come to the point now where I'm just like okay just give it to me I don't care anymore so there are two scientists that try and take Stephen and they do end up kidnapping him turns out they've been doing some experiments so there are these huge birds and like little things as well so like Stephen's become little and it turns out that um there was a, a what was it again? It was like some kind of hawk that Stephen had got like earlier on and the hawk had like licked him. So like it took a while for it to kick in, but that's what made him shrink. And so Stephen ends up getting another bird to lick him and he becomes big again and he escapes. So that's kind of like the story of this. And it's not scary. It's not anything. It's not even funny. It's just... It was an eye roll. Largely boring, so I gave this one a rating of 3.07. There is, you know, little bits of tense moments, especially when Stephen is tiny. We do have a moment with a spider. But again, that kind of reminded me of Attack of the Graveyard Ghouls when I think the main character's soul or spirit becomes like a rat or something and then turns into a cat and something like that. And I got that vibe from that. So this was less than fine. It really didn't do anything for me. This next one, the Five Massive Doctor Scream. I mean, one, I love the cover, and I did love the cover for Night of the Giant Everything. Who did these covers? Cover design by Steve Scott, cover art by Brandon Dolman. So I do love his covers. He's done a fantastic job with these covers, and I love this. And I love the fact that this is a special edition, because this is a little bit bigger than previous books. Not as big as We Had a Halloween, but this is around about 40 pages bigger than usual. And I couldn't really tell why. It just... 
there are two parts to this. It could have just been one long story, like it, nothing changed or anything. But I did quite like this one a lot and I think this is my favourite Hall of Horrors book. So I gave this one a 4.93 rating and I think it was quite adventurous. I liked the main characters. So we had Monica and her younger brother Peter. They are trick-or-treating and they go to a woman's house called Bella and Bella shows them this magical book and in this book is their name and they have to like kind of save the world or something. So Bella gives them like this sort of task where uh, they have to retrieve the five masks of Dr. Scream before he does because he's evil. And I do really love that story and I thought that part of it was like quite intriguing. So we do have like Monica and Peter, they do end up going on like this adventure to find these masks and every time they put on a mask they are transported to somewhere else. So there was like a kind of mummy mask. So they're transported to ancient Egypt where they have to fight something and then they come back when they've fought it. Honestly like a lot of the times it was just like they'd be transported and something would transpire where the would just be like a little kerfuffle and they would be back home but you know what they'd acquire the mask and I did like that idea of it so there's five different places they go I remember one of them was a bit of a wolf village thing so like there are different things and some of them were nods I think to the original Horrorland series so like when they go to the wolf village thing there is a wolf village in Horrorland so yeah it was pretty good I wasn't really sure about the ending though I feel like Arl Stein is like the Stephen King of children's authors he can't write an ending for shit so yeah Bella and Dr. Scream end up facing off and kind of like destroying each other and then Monica and Peter end up having to sort of wish for their life to be back to normal and forget what happened and then when they get home I think it was Monica who sees the the mask and she screams and then I'm kind of a little bit confused because I don't understand then if she forgot everything if her memory was wiped clean how is she telling the story to the story keeper at the start of this book? So, <laughs> I don't know if maybe her memory came back straight away, but I mean, if she wished for her memory of that night to go away, like, to have it reckoned literally the next page would be weird. It would be a really terrible kind of ending. And it kind of is a bit of a terrible ending. Kind of let this book down, quite honestly. Otherwise, this would have been a higher rating. But, you know, it's definitely one of the stronger ones, and I think it kind of beats a lot of the Horrorland books as well. I don't think there's anything more to say about this. Other than, you know what, I was like reading this, I was like, you know what, I'm not hating my life right now. And that's a sign of a good Goosebumps book from the later era of Goosebumps. <laughs> Why I Quit Zombie School, it reminded me of another Goosebumps spook. I think it was Earth Geeks Must Go, when the characters are having to go to school as normal, even though there were like alien things, I think. Or was it this one? I don't know. I might be getting my wires crossed, but I think the premise is a little bit like Earth Geeks Must Go meets Creature Teacher. So anyway, we do have Matt and his parents and again like terrible parents they end up sending Matt to a boarding school called Romero Academy and I like the fact that we had some horror movie director references in this. We had George Romero, we had Wes Craven and I believe we also had Eli Roth so I did enjoy those kind of references actually. I was kind of enjoying myself reading this. I mean none of the Goosebumps books are really that serious but I feel like this one doesn't take itself too seriously and I feel like I had a bit more fun with this than usual because of that because some of it was quite humorous I did laugh a couple of times but yeah Matt is part of this Romero Academy and everybody is a zombie except from him and he has to like pretend to be a zombie in order to blend in otherwise they will probably eat him so there is a little bit of tension because there is the risk of him being found out he does make a friend called Franny and she turns out to be a zombie as well because all the kids are dead and she was supposed to keep an eye on him and betray him but she ends up like liking him and actually becoming his friend so I like that aspect of it too. I do think that sometimes there were like a few plot holes in kind of the rules of this zombie school and the like rules of these zombies in general and it seemed like a lot of them were like willfully ignorant because it seemed like Matt was like so obviously alive because he had like more energy than everyone else and he would keep doing things that would make him be exposed and then they would just kind of not get it so that frustrated me a little bit and this is one of like the few endings I do kind of like so he does end up managing to convince the other zombies that he is a zombie but then he convinces his parents to get him out of that school and then he gets enrolled in a different school and it turns out they're all vampires and it's Dracula Middle School so that's kind of like funny and it is a bit like other R.L. Stein endings of course but I just feel like I had a bit more fun with this than I usually would with other books. So I gave this one a rating of 4.43.
not terrible, quite humorous. And I, at this point, didn't take it too seriously. And I try not to with any of the Goosebumps books, but I feel like this just knew what it wanted to be to begin with and went with it and had fun with it. But it was very similar to, I think, Earth Geeks Must Go and Creature Teacher. So again, no originality, <laughs> but what do I expect? Every time I say the title of this book, my mind instantly goes to Don't Speak by No Doubt. So I like the title a lot. This one's an odd one and I will give props to R.L. Stein for changing it up a little bit. This one incorporates a lot more technology and makes that a little bit more horrific. So we follow Jack and on a school bus, he is like kind of like bullied by a couple of bullies and he ends up finding this mobile phone next to him and that was like a little bit convenient like it just appears out of nowhere and stuff and, and whatever so like it was very easy and then this voice called Emmy starts talking to him from this phone and she knows his name and he can't really get rid of her and she seems to be able to inhabit other sources of technology so when he like even destroys this phone she is in his player or whatever I think it was like a a game player kind of thing or a game station so he just can't get rid of her but then I don't understand how at the very end he got rid of her by giving her to someone else when he also did that a couple of times before then so I'm just a bit perplexed at how he managed to defeat Emmy. But other than that, genuinely, like, not really much else happens. It's just him trying to get rid of Emmy. And she is trying to be sinister, like, I will hurt you, or, like, you can't get rid of me, and stuff like that. And I'm just like, hmm, hmm, it's not that spooky, hun. So I feel like this lacked the execution, but I kind of like the fact that Aura Sign gave us something a little bit different. I don't think I can liken this to anything else. My mind has kind of gone blank on that. I don't think I've read something like this. Maybe The Haunted Car? maybe then i think that's a bit of a stretch of a comparison but it is what it is dawn scream is i think rather forgettable even though it is a little bit different than the norm so it gets a rating of 3.21 i could have went my whole life without reading this essentially but it wasn't as bad as the next book so finally the birthday party of no return this title is so misleading there is literally like one scene with the birthday party but that's about it. There's no birthday party, no return. Nobody gets trapped in a birthday party or like nobody goes missing during a birthday party. Like nothing to do with that happens in this at all. This essentially just follows somebody called Lee and he has really bad luck. And we've seen this story 55 million times, not just in Goosebumps, but like in other media in general. And he ends up getting a package from an unknown sender and it has a sort of like a vulture claw in it that gives him good luck. But then when this claw is kissed, it turns into bad luck. And that's essentially what the book is. It gives him good luck for a while and then he starts getting bad luck. He has a friend called Corey and Corey seems to be getting really good luck himself. Turns out he also got like a vulture's claw thing and that's why he's been getting good luck. I mean, that's fine. They were quite competitive with one another. It reminded me of the friendship in How I Learned to Fly where there were like two friends competing against one another. And I believe there was also a kind of love interest, a, a female love interest in that one as well. They have another friend called Laura who it turns out is the person who gave them both the claw. I mean, it was sort of funny how while they were kind of the three of them competing, Corey and Lee were like too focused on one another to really notice Laura. So Laura was the winner kind of thing. Like she came out the best out of this, but she did give them both the vulture's claw and she'd already kissed them and gave them bad luck. I mean, that was kind of funny, but nothing else really great happened in this. The characters did feel a little bit more fleshed out than other Goosebumps books. I felt a little bit more relatability to them. So this one I gave a rating of 2.64 and it's definitely the worst Hall of Horrors book. Still a little better than some of the worst of the Horrorland books, but it's still not great. And I just hate the fact that the title is so misleading, like the birthday party in all return. Why? Why is it called that? And the whole story of like bad luck and all that, I'm, I'm bored with that storyline. So yeah, not a good book to end on. And I feel like every single Goosebumps series have ended with a pretty bad book. The original series had Monster Blood 4, hated. The series 2000 book had, oh, actually the series 2000 book had Ghost in the Mirror and I quite liked that book, that was fine. So that one was all right. And then the Goosebumps Horrorland series, oh yeah, that ended with the Horror at Chella House and that was a bit of a letdown book as well. So yeah, this is probably the second worst series ending book. So Monster Blood 4 was definitely still bottom of that. And then this one I think comes quite close to that. Yeah, nothing else to say about this one other than 
really didn't like it. So now I need to rank all of these Horrorland books as well as tell you the overall series average and how it compares to the original series and series 2000. So going back to the average board then, the Goosebumps Horrorland series ended up with an average of 3.84. So it's much worse than both the original and the series 2000 series. And I was hoping it would be a bit closer to them. It took a tumble and it started out so promising as well where say like Revenge of the Living Dummy was all right. Creep on the Deep was really really good and even the scream of the haunted mask i really enjoyed but it seemed like after that it just it fell apart and we saw that R. Stein was relying too heavily on a lot of his previous stories in order to tell new stories even though they weren't new they were just repackaged ideas he's already had and already gave us. Definitely love the fact that he tried something different with the Horrorland aspect of it by having the characters go to Horrorland at the end of each book and have that kind of Goosebumps Avengers moment with different characters but I still can't also overlook the fact that the book series is so poorly written that the timeline is all over the place and none of it makes sense. Carly Beth and Billy and Sheena should not be in the late 2000s, which is when the book series is definitely set because of all the modern day technology that's in them. And on that merit alone, it just shows you that these Goosebumps books are not really planned very well. And I question whether they actually have an editor and if Oral Stein even really cares. He just writes the one draft and gets it out. That's what I think. <laughs> Prove me wrong. Also, I believe there is a survival guide Goosebumps Horrorland book. So there's like an unofficial sort of 20th book in the Horrorland series. It's more of a fun companion book to the Horrorland series so it's not like an actual story or anything but I think that would be really interesting to get my hands on so I might try and get that but I did look on eBay and uh, I don't think it's going to happen but I did want to mention that as well there is a survival guide but it's not part of this ranking or anything because it's not an actual story so I didn't know this until like literally today. <laughs> so this is my Goosebumps Horrorland ranking from worst to best and I won't be going in depth on what I think of each book this is just a list from 19 through to number one so if you want to know my thoughts on these books specifically all the timestamps are down in the description box in case you've skipped to this moment. So let's get into the ranking. In at number 19 and my least favourite Goosebumps Horrorland book is Little Shop of Hamsters and this one I gave 1.43 out of 10. In at number 18 is Dr. Maniac vs. Robbie Schwartz and this one has a rating of 2.00. In at number 17 is The Wizard of Ooze with a rating of 2.29. In at number 16 is Monster Blood for Breakfast and this one has a rating of 2.57. In at number 15 is Welcome to Camp Slither and this one has a rating of 2.71. In at number 14 is Slappy New Year and this one has a rating of 2.86. In at number 13 is Who's Your Mummy and this one has a rating of 3.00. In at number 12 is My Friends Call Me Monster and this one has a rating of 3.14. In at number 11 is Help We Have Strange Powers and this one has a rating of 3.29. In at number 10 is The Horror at Chiller House and this one has a rating of 3.57. In at number 9 is Say Cheese and Die Screaming and this one has a rating of 3.86. In at number 8 is We Are Halloween and this one has a rating of 4.14. In at number 7 is When the Ghost Dog Howl and this one has a rating of 4.57. In at number 6 is Escape from Horrorland and this one has a rating of 4.71. In at number 5 is Heads You Lose and this one has a rating of 4.86. In at number 4 is Revenge of the Living Dummy and this one has a rating of 5.29. In at number 3 is The Streets of Panic Park and this one has a rating of 5.43. In at number 2 is The Scream of the Haunted Mask and this one has a rating of 5.86. And then finally my favourite Goosebumps Horrorland book is Creep from the Deep and this one has a rating of 7.36. So this is my current ranking of these books and there is quite a gap between number one and number two. I definitely think this is like the only standout book from this series, the, the Horrorland series, and I think the rest of them range from pretty mediocre to downright terrible. So the Hall of Horrors series next. I don't think it did anything groundbreaking either. I don't think it really changed them all too much and I did like to begin with the kind of storyteller aspect of it, having the character go to the Hall of Horrors to tell the story keeper a story. It was very atmospheric to begin with, but then it just didn't do anything else with it for the rest of the series, really. So fortunately, this was only six books, and I was worried that the average might be a little bit too high, but it turns out that this is like the worst Goosebumps series so far, with a rating of 3.71. And with there being so few books, I did think that if I gave one or two of them a really good rating, that it would kind of inflate the average for it, because there isn't that many to go off of but it didn't matter. I would say like all of them actually were mediocre to terrible. Not a single one of them got above a 5 out of 10. Not a single one. So I don't know if that's like a really terrible sign for the future of the Goosebumps series. Again it wasn't a strong or memorable series at all and yes yeah, just slightly worse than the Horrorland series. So I will rank them now from worst to best. 
this will be over in two seconds. But in at number six is The Birthday Party of No Return with a rating of 2.64. In at number five is Night of the Giant Everything with a rating of 3.07. In at number four is Dawn Scream with a rating of 3.21. In at number three is Close with a rating of 4.00. In at number two is Why I Quit Zombie School with a rating of 4.43. And then in at number one and my favourite book in the whole of horror series is The Five Masks of Doctor Scream with a rating of 4.93. So this is how I would rank the whole of horror series and yeah not a single one got above a 5 out of 10 which is kind of diabolical <laughs> but so happy and glad that it's over and I can put the Horrorland Hall of Horrors era behind me. So what is the kind of future of my Goosebumps series which I've kind of tentatively called the Goosebumps Postmortem series on my channel. I do have a playlist of my Goosebumps videos and I will link it down in the description box if you want to check them out but I will be covering the next two main Goosebumps series which are the only two main series left I have to read. There are kind of side and spin-off series like Give Yourself Goosebumps and Tales of give you goosebumps as well. It is really difficult for me to get my hands on all of the Give Yourself Goosebumps books. They stopped releasing them in the UK after I think book number 36. There are quite a few that I'm missing. I think it's around about 52 of them and I only own like five of them. So it would take a long time for me to try and get my hands on them unless somebody wants to send me them. Or if like an eBay seller like puts them all in one bundle, I will probably buy them that way. But also Give Yourself Goosebumps will be really hard to review because of the nature of the books being a kind of choose your own adventure series. But I do get that question a lot, like if I'm going to cover the Give Yourself Goosebumps series. It is a spin-off series and I only wanted to cover the main series, which includes Goosebumps, Series 2000, Horrorland, Hall of Horrors, and then the next two that I'm doing. But I might try after I've done the main series to see if I can get my hands on them and if I can do the other spin-off series as well. So yes, the next main series I'm doing is the Goosebumps Most Wanted series and it does look pretty good that series but again I thought that of the Horrorland series and I was proven wrong but I will be going into the Most Wanted series with the best of intentions and hopes that it will prove me wrong and make me happy and that's all I want I just want to read the Goosebumps series and for it to be like yes this is what I wanted so I'm still holding out hope and that will most likely be around about March or April 2023 because I like to give around about six months between the Goosebumps series for me to recover and then probably will be ending off with the Goosebumps Slappy World series I think the final book for that will be coming out around about the end of next year so around October 2023 fingers crossed. I don't think there's a solid release date for the final book in the Sappy World series but as soon as that book comes out I will do my vlog for it. So if that does get delayed until like 2024 then that's what I'll have to do but at the minute that one should be around about October 2023. So those are the next two kind of Goosebumps vlogs you can look forward to or not look forward to depending on if you like love or hate my opinions. So yeah that is pretty much the end of this vlog. I have no idea how many hours this has come up to but hopefully it hasn't been too long but thank you so much for sitting through Away. I really appreciate it if you did. Don't forget to give a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all the comments down below. Talk goosebumps to me. Have you read the Horrorland series and the Hall of Horror series? Do you have a favourite from this era of R.L. Stein and goosebumps? Please let me know so we can chat about it. Honestly, feel free to write anything down below, even if your opinion is different to mine. If you disagree with a lot of stuff, just let me know. I'd love to talk to you about it. A huge thank you to my patrons for supporting my channel and making content like this possible. If you'd like to join my Patreon or follow me on any social media, then all of the links are down in the description box. But yeah, that's it. And I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye. <sighs>